And welcome back everybody here in Twitch chats and also on YouTube if you're watching this video later on over there. For our last installment of the War of the Spark standard set review, we have our multicolored and colorless and artifact and lands. There's not as many as those, but putting those all together for the final part of our set review here. This will be the longest part. Uh, it, it has the most cards and there's a lot more cards that aren't just made for limited. You know, like there's a lot more constructed cards here in uh, these ones also. So we, you know, we'll be talking a lot about all these cards. So uh, settle in, get, get your popcorn ready, and Hawkeye's ready to start off with a Johnny the Great Hearted. I guess I should say uh, we're doing this on a letter grade scale, A through F, or if it's just a common or uncommon, it's made for limited. It just gets the limited rating. Uh, if you're in Twitch chat, you can hit exclamation point grade, as you see at the top, to uh, for the uh, Google Doc with the grading scale. Or if you're watching this later on on YouTube, the grading scale is just down below in the info panel. All right. So a Johnny the Great Hearted, two green and a white for a five loyalty planeswalker. Creatures you control have vigilance. Plus one, you gain three life. Minus two, put a 1-1 one, one counter on each creature you control and a loyalty counter on each other Planeswalker you control. This card's pretty sweet. I think this this one um, can be a little underrated, where people just see the plus ability just to gain some life, and they're like, yeah, is that really that good? I'm like, I guess if you have a bunch of other creatures, you can put some counter on, on them. But if you think about playing like a creature on turn two and a creature on turn three, then if you have the a Johnny that we have in standard right now, a Johnny Adversary of Tyrants, you can tick that up and put a creature on, or sorry, put you can tick up a Johnny and put a counter on those already. You don't need to minus a Johnny to put a counter on them like you would need to with, with this one. Um, however, so, like, you know, that's that's a point in favor of, of the current Johnny. However, the, the creatures you control have Vigilance, I think is actually a, a really nice part of this card that kind of gets overlooked the people are just you know just don't really mind that but being able to attack and still be able to play defense and you know being able to do both is a really nice part of combat um, so I, I really like that first part giving all your creatures vigilance um gain like having having it be a five loyalty planeswalker already on turn four and then you tick up to be six loyalty immediately that's that's a lot of loyalty you know we're looking at like car and scion of urza and standard is like the same kind of thing that starts at six loyalty after you tick up all right bye okay um so like if you're playing against a red deck like where you go up to six loyalty immediately gain three life it's going to be pretty tough for them to like have enough damage to kill the ajani and then also go back and kill you like it's a huge huge uh like fog effect basically even on its own with nothing else out against red and so it looks to be a really good card against red decks um and then besides that all right so let's talk about the minus two ability so we're putting a one one counter on every creature we control all right so not just two creatures like how the other johnny does so uh, think about unbreakable formation in this format in like mono white how people play unbreakable formation to put a 1-1 one, one counter on all their creatures, give them Vigilance, um, and also, of course, you get to make them indestructible for a turn. Now, obviously, that indestructible is really good, but instead of instead of getting that, you get this Planeswalker in play where you get to do it again the next turn. Also, by putting a counter on all your stuff again the next turn and everything. So you have the, you know, cost one more than that. Um, but we've seen Unbreakable Formation be a really good card in the format. And then finally, it does help other Planeswalkers also. So if you want to have a Super Friends deck, or if you're just playing a couple other Planeswalkers, like if you're playing Gideon, uh, you know, you get you know you get to put another loyalty counter on your Gideon. If you play Gideon on Gideon Blackblade on turn three, take it up to five, next turn play a Johnny and tick down a Johnny, your Gideon is now at six loyalty. And if you want if you need to exile a non-land permanent, you can do that with the Gideon there. This does put a 1-1 one, one counter on the Gideon and a loyalty counter on the Gideon. So you do make your Gideon a 5-5, five, five, plus it gets an extra loyalty counter. Um, so this card seems to be able to do a whole lot. Where this card won't be good is really against like control decks with lots of sweepers. Because in that kind of matchup, the gain 3 life doesn't really matter. Uh, they can just kill If they're just killing your creatures, then you don't really have creatures to put 1-1 one, one counters on them. 
if you're so if you're on an empty battlefield against a removal heavy deck, a Johnny the Great Hearted not going to be too good um, uh, for you there. So is this is this like a sideboard card against aggro decks? Maybe you know because it does have does have the ability to gain you so much life and everything like that is this a card you want to play against other creature decks absolutely you know because if you if you can just get like battlefield stalls and have this a johnny will just take over with the minus two just growing your um team so much um yeah and this this is a card and yeah just like uh, gomez says that this is a card you would side you'd most likely just sideboard out against control um yeah but this this can be like a green white like green white tokens people are saying like naya aggro kind of thing um you know like creature heavy um aggro decks also like abzan works really well with like the afterlife stuff um you know if you're trading off with like your seraph of the scales and tithe takers and you're making the one one creature like flying creatures and you turn those into being two two flying creatures those are pretty big you know like two two flyers are, are nice like those end games pretty quickly Hey, King Saul, good evening. Uh, so overall, um, as far as our, our grade goes, seeing a lot of people saying like a B, a B plus, an A minus. I think I'm kind of probably towards like the B, like a defining card in like a, a singular deck kind of thing. Like there's probably like one a Johnny deck. Maybe a B plus. I could see that. I could see just the Johnny making its way into different creature decks, actually, because we talked about like Abzan, Green White Tokens, Naya. There's a lot of places to put this card. Um, is it a format staple uh, that, you know, like whenever you're building your, your decks, you're like, okay, there's a Johnny Greathearted in the format. I got to worry about a Johnny kind of thing. You know, like how for uh, our format staples, we're talking about like Hydro Crisis, Mortify, Kaya's Wrath. Like those are cards that you're thinking about when you're building your decks. I, I don't think it's there. I don't think it's an A, but I like B plus for a Johnny. I think that's a, a good solid grade there. Um, it does go very well with Bola Citadel. Yes, I am going to be putting this in my Abzan Bola Citadel deck that I that I'm going to make. Um, this does work pretty well there because it does give you a lot of life to um, to be able to cast your cards for free with Bola Citadel. Um, question: Does this replace the other Ajani? Would use it over this one? It depends. It depends on the type of deck, really. And it also kind of depends on the matchups that you want. Like the other Ajani is going to be a lot better against control than this Ajani will be. This Ajani is going to be a lot better against aggro. This Ajani is going to be a lot better when you're playing a deck that goes really wide. Uh, the other Ajani is going to be better uh, against, or the other Ajani is just going to be better whenever you have like one or two threats that you're pumping up, or you know like the when you're playing like the two drops that you want to get back kind of thing. Um, but yeah, pairing this with the new Gideon. Uh, that does work pretty well. All right. Uh, Angrath's Rampage. Red and a black. Sorcery. Choose one. Target player sacrifices an artifact. Target creature. Target player sacrifices a creature. Or target player sacrifices a planeswalker. So you can make a player sacrifice one of those three things. <laughs> Johnny is a draw three whenever you have Lich's Mastery in play. That is true. Johnny could just draw three then. All right, so uh, Angrass Rampage. I think this is another card that's kind of underrated. I think people see this and see, ah, it's sorcery speed. You know, I don't, I don't really want this. Yeah, it's, it's a bedevil at sorcery speed. This isn't any good kind of thing. I feel like it's, 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 it's still good. So the, the big thing that it has over bedevil is that it costs two mana. Planeswalker removal at two mana and even just creature removal at two mana is really strong. Like the, there's a reason why we play a lot of cast down and we don't play murder, you know, like there's, you know, murder is just strictly better than cast down, but nobody plays murder. Everybody plays cast down. The difference between two and three mana is huge. And I think that Angrass Rampage being two mana is honestly going to be really nice. Um, yeah. It's, and so, cause like on turn two, sure. You got, they can sacrifice any creature, but on turn two, they're usually just play their two drop. You and you're gonna like kill their two drop anyway. You know, like they just play their wild growth walker. That's what you're gonna kill on turn two anyway. So you have them sacrifice that creature. Usually not so bad. Uh, it does give like a Grixis deck a, a really nice answer to um, Carnage Tyrant also. 
uh, gives a good answer to a Danto Vanguard kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think the the key part is like the the Planeswalker removal for two mana. And even though it's even though it's not a great uh, creature removal spell, it's you know serviceable, but it's not fantastic. Um, I, I think that this this is certainly a card that can see some standard play. It's it's definitely not great against. There are a lot of other things in the format that's not great against. You know, like if your if your opponent's playing like an afterlife kind of deck, you know, make them sacrifice their Tithe Taker. Uh, you know, sacrifice for a Kindling Phoenix. They're just going to get back a Sarah for the scales. You know, like there's there's certainly downsides to the card, um, but in that kind of thing, you can probably wait for a planeswalker. This set just has so many planeswalkers, right? And if like all these planeswalkers do see a good amount of play, and Grass Rampage is going to be a premium removal spell for planeswalkers being at two mana at that point. So overall. Um, this this is a card that you know it still has its flaws of course but i think a lot of people are overlooking it when you know it could be a a good removal spell in the format so i'm going to be going with um maybe like a c i think this is just probably a card that can be just pretty common uh in like a highly played deck uh, but not necessarily anything special you know it's not going to be mo- it's most likely not going to be a four of you know, depending on what happens with the metagame. But I think a C is a solid rating for Angrath Rampage here. Yeah, it, it is looked at mostly as Planeswalker removal. But it can do other things. It's good to have options. All right, Bio Essence Hydra. Three green and a blue for a 4-4 trample. Bio Essence Hydra enters the battlefield with a 1-1 counter on it for each loyalty counter on Planeswalkers you control. Whenever one or more loyalty counters are put on Planeswalkers you control, put that many 1-1 counters on Bio Essence Hydra. This thing is big. Very big. Now, let's say you don't have any Planeswalkers in play because you're not, you're not lucky. Then you're playing 5 mana for a 4-4 trample. As we see in Stamp is in standard that is not nearly good enough for standard um yeah so like you basically have to have a planeswalker in play just to kind of make this card uh doable you know if you look at like the five mana slots in standard you know we're talking about like ilharg the raise bore at six six trample same thing with uh doom whisper six six flying trample you know like four four you know dying to lava coil finality that kind of stuff not not very good if you have like a Planeswalker, like maybe you have a Johnny the Great Hearted that you played at turn four, you ticked up to six. Um, the next turn, you tick it up to seven. You play your Bio Essence Hydra and you make an 11 11 Trampler. That's very big. I mean, you're talking about Galta level there, right? Um, and so, like, there's a lot of Planeswalkers in that, uh, in that respect that, um, that uh, work really well. Like, there's a lot of four mana planeswalkers that can have a lot of loyalty. All right, so yeah, there's also Kiora. Um, yeah, y'all are saying that we should talk about Kiora with that card. So yeah, Kiora does. Like, Kiora would basically be the reason to play that card, right? Um, Pro- Proliferate does hit them twice if you have a planeswalker in play, yes. So if you also have a planeswalker in play, then whenever you proliferate, you'd put a counter on the Hydra and the Planeswalker, um, assuming the Hydra already had counters on it, of course. And then whenever the counter goes on the Planeswalker, you'd put another counter on the the Hydra. So yeah, over like the Hydra, I don't I don't know, but like you know we have Galta and stuff. Like we have like ways to make really big creatures. I'm not sure about it, but if there is a way to play the Hydra, it is with Kiora, with Kiora having this first ability of whenever a creature with a bow, battle uh, with power four greater enters the battlefield under your control draw a card so if that thing just enters and draws a card then now we're talking you know the the problem is and of course Kiora has a whole lot of loyalty it does go down but it it could have a lot of loyalty whenever you're playing um <clears throat> the uh, bio essence hydra 
The real problem is, you know, having your, your Planeswalker out in play that uh, that has to survive and everything, and then drawing a card with it. Basically, that that is like a, a fringe... <laughs> Can somebody give an example of a fringe deck nowadays? Um, uh, a fringe deck nowadays would be... Uh, I mean, like, basically what we're talking about here, the bi a Bioessence Hydra Kiora deck. Like, that that's certainly, like, a, a fringe kind of deck. Um, nowadays, like, the Priest of Forgotten Gods, Judith, like, Black Red, um, aggro decks, like, that's a, that's a fringe deck. You know, so, like, that, that would be a, an example of a fringe deck, like, right now. Um, whether that's, like, Mardu or, or just Black Red, like, that's, that's a fringe deck. So I'm I'm giving Bioessence Hydra a D here. I think it, you know it could be a you can build around Bio Bioessence Hydra basically. Um, you know it's a, a janky build around card kind of thing. Uh, I'm not too excited about it in like a normal Simic or Sultai deck like with all of the other good cards that we have in standard. Bioessence Hydra isn't really making the cut for me. But if you want to build your Bioessence Hydra um, Cure deck, you certainly can. All right, we have Casualties of War. Two black, black, green, green, sorcery. Choose one or more. Destroy an artifact, creature, enchantment, land, planeswalker. So, you know, you get to destroy as much as you can with those. So it is six mana, and it's double black and double green. So that, that does really narrow the amount of decks you can, you can put it in, being double black, double green. Um, but this card's pretty sweet. I think this one is also kind of underrated. In a world where we have four mana wrath effects, uh, it this does look, um, you know, like like you may not like really want this. I think, <clears throat> man, y'all are going with F for this card. I think the big part that makes this card good is the destroy target land. I think that that is a really valuable thing in standard. Um, even though, you know, we're talking at, at six mana, but being able to destroy a land along with the creature and a planeswalker, um, you know, this is this kind of just reminds me similar of Star of Extinction. Now, it is it is different where Star of Extinction, you know, destroys everything and gets rid of a land. But this is the kind of card that you can, you know, Star of Extinction, you kind of want in only a certain type of deck. Like, you don't really want to have your own creatures and planeswalkers and stuff out when you're playing a Star of Extinction. This Casualties of War, you can just have in your normal, like, Sultai kind of deck, or just, you know, like a, in a Golgari grind em out deck. And whenever, like, the game, the battlefield gets, uh, um, battlefield gets clogged up, you destroy their planeswalker, destroy their best creature, and destroy a land. Destroying a land in these, in mid range matchups, like, they're all about who spends the most mana throughout the entire, entirety of the game. And it's the reason why we've seen, um, a, uh, not Abrupt Decay, the new one. <clears throat> Assassin's Trophy. All right, sorry. Assassin's Trophy hasn't seen a ton of play because getting your giving your opponent the land is a, is a huge downside early on in the game. This is obviously destroying a land late in the game, so it's not as uh, impressive as destroying a land early. But still, I kind of like it. Um... <clears throat> yeah, so against a lot of decks, this destroys two permanents at for six mana at sorcery speed. That's basically the, the downside, right? Like, that's, like, the worst it's going to do is destroy a land and then plus either, like, one creature or one planeswalker. Um, that's, like, the, the very worst it can do. So for that at six mana, is that worth it? No. It is not worth just destroy a creature and destroy a land for six mana. You really need to get three things with this card for it to be worth it. You need to get you know, a land plus two other permanents. And that's whenever you're talking Casualty of Wars being pretty good there. Um, yeah, and there are a lot of good lands now, too. Yeah, this set has a lot of good utility lands. And then, yeah, you do have stuff like Flipped as Kanta and Arch of Araska and Memorial to Folly. And, you know, like, there are just a, a lot of pretty decent lands. Um, yeah. So... Basically, I think people are kind of sleeping on this card a little bit. As we saw, like, whenever we first started talking about it, people were just saying F and it's a commander card kind of thing. 
is this going to be like a highly played card? Probably not. Um, one place like that I am I'm looking to play this is in like my five color Niv Mizzet like ramp deck, where this is like a Golgari card to grab in that kind of deck, uh, where you know like you're going to be behind and you're playing like a, a control deck, and you know like uh, Niv Mizzet, uh, you know cares about each each color pair. I feel like that's that's a pretty good green and black card to be able to grab uh, like a powerful effect um, that can help catch you up kind of thing. So, uh, yeah. So basically, I think I think this is kind of going to be a um, is it like precognitive perception level at C? Maybe not uh, in the format. So probably like C minus here. I feel like a C minus is pretty good, but basically, don't don't sleep on the card. You know, remember it's it's something to it's something in the format. <clears throat> cruel celebrant white black one two whenever cruel celebrant or another creature or opponent or sorry creature or planeswalker you control dies each opponent loses a life and you gain a life all right we got our blood artist in standard we got it back um two mana one two body with no abilities whatsoever it's just not going to do anything in combat basically just not going to really do anything in combat however that effect of every time any of your stuff dies, they lose a life, you gain a life. That is awesome. Pair this with like Judith, the Scourge Diva, and people are dying really quickly whenever your stuff's dying. So I think, you know, like they're trying to make Mardu aristocrats. Um, and I think this is a, a key part of the Mardu aristocrat deck. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't trigger for itself. Or no, it does. Never mind. Sorry. I was just looking at the word another. Sorry. Obviously, it says whenever Cruel Celebrant. Okay, so good. It does trigger for itself as well. That's good. Good. Uh, we do have a free sack outlet with Priest of Forgotten Gods. That's our free sacrifice outlet. Besides that, uh, Pitiless Pontiff being a one mana sacrifice outlet is still pretty good. Um, so I, I do think this slots... Yeah, this slots into, for now, probably a... A fringe deck, you know, like that Mardu Aristocrat deck. I, I think I'm still just calling that a fringe deck. So I, I'm going to go ahead and call this a C, kind of like Priest of Forgotten Gods from the last set. A powerful card for a fringe archetype. However, this does have the uh, potential to turn into a B. You know, like if that does turn into a highly played deck, uh, then, you know, it, if it's a cornerstone to the highly played deck, it has the ability to go out to a B kind of thing. <clears throat> Yeah, so every every token triggers as well. Yep, that is pretty exciting. All right, how about Death Sprout? One black, black, green, instant, destroy target creature, search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. This card looks pretty sweet. You know, we get, you know, basically cast down, or murder, I guess, murder plus rampant growth, instant speed for four mana. This card's really not bad. What kind of deck wants to play this, though? I don't know. Do we want to, like, Sultai Control kind of thing? Do we want, yeah, a Golgari Ramp deck? Uh, the BB is pretty rough for if you're, like, a, a really green-heavy Ramp deck, like, where you're, like, pl trying to play Nyssa and everything in, in that kind of Ramp deck. Um, an Abzan Control, yeah. So if you're playing, yeah, an Abzan Control. Uh, so, like, I could see, I could see Death Sprout helping out casualty of wars also like i could see uh a death sprout casualty of wars kind of control deck whether it's sultai or abzan um potentially jund i suppose if you want to play casualty of wars and star of extinction together um that's you know now we're talking you want to make a, a jund land destruction kind of deck now we're talking um but it does yeah it does help fix your mana uh it does mean that you need like the the kind of awkward part about it is you know it only gets basic land where our mana is so good with our shock and uh buddy lands that you don't really play a lot of basic lands in those three color decks um so it does kind of mess with your mana a little bit of like you know kind of requiring you to play like pro like if you're playing a couple of these you probably need like three or four basic lands to make sure that you you do have a target to go get um so yeah, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be for a Sultai mid range deck that's playing like Chubacabra hostage taker kind of thing. It'd be more for like a Sultai control deck uh, that's playing a lot more spells, that's playing like Search for Iskanta, 
uh, chemisters insight like that kind of thing you know like you you can have four mana uh, you know you, are you going to chemisters insight or are you going to death sprout you know like you have your gross spiral on turn two um and then on turn three do you do you want to insight do you want to death sprout you know that could be like a soul tie control deck with like wilderness reclamation even if you, if you want to have that uh ridiculous card in your deck but yeah death sprout's pretty cool pretty cool so what i say for casualty of wars i said like a c plus um I could see this being the same kind of thing, you know, like a C plus. Um, I, I like I like both of those cards. Those are those are cards that I'm excited to play. Casualty of Wars and Death Sprout. All right, Dispark. White, black for an instant. Exile target permanent with CMC four or greater. Wow. Talk about a really good uh, planeswalker removal spell for your Teferis, your Nicol Boluses. Get those things out of there. Uh, Rekindling Phoenix, Seraph of the Scales, those are great things to exile. It is awkward that you know, like your your opponent plays their two mana creature. You're sitting at, you're looking at your two mana, your only two mana card in your hand, which is your Dispark, and you're looking at that creature, and you're like, man, that creature's gonna kill me. I can't, I can't kill it with this Dispark. Um. Oh, it is awesome against Arc. Uh, it is awesome against Arclight Phoenix also um yeah like this card this card's really good is this a main deck card though like are you playing this are you playing this main deck uh you know wellness reclamation get that out of here there are of course you know like if you're playing you know you play against mono white mono blue mono black mono red sorry uh those decks you're not uh really disparking anything um I'll be saying, yeah, it's a main deck card or two in the main, um, maybe a one of. It is. It's very, very efficient at what it does. Exiling is awesome. It's very efficient at what it does, but it is a little narrow. Um, Vartos says zero in the main sideboard only. Ritual of Soot and Dispark is a that is a strong combination of being able to. But the problem is when you're, whenever you have Ritual of Soot, at that point, you know, for like this kind of deck, you are a white-black deck. Probably heavy white and black if you have both of those. Um, so you, you can't have Kaiserath at that point. Okay, so yeah. So people may, may be saying like one main, one side, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I feel like this is... I feel like that's where we're kind of at. I don't think this is going to be like four ofs in decks kind of thing. Like, so I don't want to go as high as a B because I think a B is like, you know, like how we talked about like growth spiral is a B uh, in my, that's like my example there where that's like a four of uh, when it sees play in a few different decks. I don't think the spark is that. So I think this is more of like the scene, the C range, even in like the sideboard. I don't think this is really like a four of sideboard card. I feel like this is just like you play a couple in your sideboard that are like really versatile that can come in against a lot of different things um and you know give you give you some good versatile answers against lots of different things um i could see it kind of taking mortify's place yeah that's where i kind of yeah i could kind of see this taking mortify's place Yeah, that's where I kind of see it. I don't, I don't know, like you know, not like four of in main deck for Esper, but like where I, where you have like some mortifies and sideboards, like you would rather have disparks and sideboards most likely. Um, yeah. All right, Domri, Anarch of Bolus, one red and a green, le three loyalty planeswalker creatures you control get plus one plus zero. Plus one, add a red and a green to your mana pool. Creature spells you cast this turn can't be countered. And minus two, target creature you control fights target creature you don't control. I think this card is awesome. I think this is really good for uh, Gruul, uh, for Gruul aggro, Gruul midrange, whichever you want to you call it there. I think this is a, a great card to have on, on the second turn after Land War Elves. Um, you know, it helps ramp for you because there's... It just fits perfect on the curve of like Land War Elves, Domri, and then the five mana, uh, the um, God Pharaohs? No, Elder Gods? No. Whatever those things are called. 
Um, God Eternals. There we go. Nailed it the first time. That's what I definitely said the first time. <laughs> so I think it fits perfectly with the God Eternals. Um, you know, getting Ilharg and Ronus out very early. Um, the creatures you control get plus one, plus zero is really nice. Uh, you know, Gruul Spellbreaker hits hard at being a three mana, four, four trampler. Now you turn that into a three mana, five, four trampler, and that's hitting even harder. And, you know, like that, you know, that's just four turns by itself kind of thing. Um, and giving your creatures plus one, plus zero helps out a card like God Eternal Ronus that also doubles the power. Um, so basically, like this is kind of dream curve, of course. But if you have, you know, uh, Land Werewolf on turn one, you have the Domri on turn two, you play Ilharg on turn three. And on turn four, you get to attack with Ilharg. Obviously, you know, we're talking dream, dream curve here. But, okay, you don't even need this on those specific turns. Let's just say you're attacking with Ilharg with Domri in play. Okay, there you go. So Ilharg uh, would then be a 7-6 trample because your creatures get plus one. So it's a 7-6. And you you put in your Ronus with your Ilharg, which doubles the power. So then it turns it into 14 trample. You have a 14 power trample creature attacking. And your Ronus is attacking and stuff too. It's pretty ridiculous. Um... So besides besides that, Domri. So Domri helps you play your spells. Um, you know, it has your your creatures aren't getting countered. That's a big plus. Your creatures are, are bigger uh, with the power part, and then also that minus two. The minus two is really what makes Domri good. You know, the fight part. You know, you're already playing some pretty big creatures in that kind of deck. You know, you're playing your Gruul Spellbreakers, your Ilhargs, and your Kindling Phoenix, and uh, you know whatever else you're playing over there. Uh, but having you you know allowing you know having a, a nice three mana removal spell that sticks around that you don't have to really just play a spot for removal you know you don't have to have like lava coil in your gruel deck for your removal spell where your lava coil is going to be dead against control you have your domri for your removal spell where domri is not going to be dead against control kind of thing um ronis what does ronis say ronis says whenever it etbs uh, you double the power of each other creature you control until end of turn. They gain Vigilance. Well, you know, if you put it into play attacking off of Ilharg, the Vigilance thing doesn't matter because that's too late. But yeah, anyway, I feel like Domri just fits perfectly in the Gruul deck. Um, is this better than Rhythm of the Wild is a question. And I, I definitely think so. I like the having like the removal spell part of this is what makes it better than than Rhythm. I think it's I think it's really comparable the plus one plus zero and the add mana can't be countered kind of thing. I think that's comparable to rhythm where rhythm says that can't be countered and then um, gives it either a one one counter or or haste and this like gives it like the plus one and adds a mana to help you cast stuff like the add mana is not that's not nothing kind of thing like that's that's certainly something. Um, but what makes this better than Rhythm is that minus two, being able to have a removal spell that doesn't take the spot of a removal spell. Um, you don't really necessarily need haste for the Boar God. I mean, obviously the Boar God is so much better with haste, but it's not like that card necessarily needs it kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's going to be much easier to play Galtas with this card. Absolutely. Giving all your creatures an additional power uh, does reduce the cost of Galta quite a bit when you have like two one land or elves and everything and then you know it also adds the mana towards Galta um, this also just you know helps you curve into Vivian really well on turn three you know you have turn two Domri turn three Vivian Vivian finds you more creatures and now you have more mana to cast those more creatures kind of thing so basically I'm so Domri I think is certainly um oh yeah and then yeah the the mana yeah so the yeah, and I guess that's what I was just saying there. Is this man is not just for creature spells. You know, you can you know you can spend it on anything. You can spend it on Vivian. Uh, you know, anything else you want to spend your mana on. Uh, Domri adds mana uh, for that. Um, so, can you theory craft a red green deck? Yeah, red a red like red green deck with those cards are going to be one of the first decks that I play uh, next Thursday whenever whenever Arena comes out there. Um, 
right now, you know, I should continue on with the, the set review, but yeah, that's, that's going to be one of the first, very first decks that I play on Thursday. Um, you know, I'll be playing like, uh, I guess like, man, there's a few decks <laughs> that I have and hopefully I'll, I'll make the decks and, and write them up and have them, uh, for y'all put them in like the, the discord channel and stuff like that before then. Um, so looking at our grading scale, I think it's, it's at the, you know, at least we're talking about a B here where we're talking about a defining card in a singular highly played deck. That's, that's kind of where we're at Domri because it is, you know, a green and red planeswalker. We're not really putting Domri in, in tons of different decks. I don't think, I think you're kind of just playing it in like the gruel deck. Maybe there's a couple different kind of shades of gruel. They get to play it, you know, like gruel dinosaurs also and, and everything. But I think we're kind of at a B here with Domri, but it's a it's a really key important card to a deck that can be highly played. Um, so B seems right. So you know it's similar to like uh, Gatebreaker Ram is really important for the gate deck kind of thing. All right, Radical Matt with the Twitch Prime sub. Thank you so much, Radical Matt. Welcome to Value Town. You are awesome. There you go. Got some hype votes in chat. All right, next up, we're going to have Domri's Ambush. Uh, red and a green, Sorcery. Put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control. Then that creature deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. So it's, it's better than fighting because the other creature won't deal damage to yours. And you get a 1-1 counter on your creature, which that's certainly nice. Will this card see play though? I even with those two things, I don't think so. I don't think we are. Um, I don't think we're playing this at sorcery speed. You know, uh, disposable hero says this is the best card to pair pair with feather hands down. Okay, okay. So if we're we're going Naya with feather and putting a counter on feather and then having feather kill something and then putting this back into our hand. That works there if you want to put it in your, your Naya Feather deck. Okay. Um, it is a flavor fail, right? Yeah, we have Ambush in the name. And so, you know, with Ambush, you're, we're thinking instant speed. You know, we're ambushing something, but then it's sorcery speed. You know, just even looking at the card, it looks like they're going really fast. Like, oh, we're thinking, oh, this is going to be instant. But no, it's a it's like a premeditated attack there at sorcery speed. <laughs> Hey, we got a couple more uh, Twitch Prime resubs here. And we have Journeys Guy saying, uh, having a great weekend, enjoying the review, Todd. Much appreciated, sir. Have a great Easter weekend, everyone. Thank you very much, Journeys Guy. You as well. And Versus also with that resub. Thank you so much, y'all. So let's go with the D for Domri's Ambush. Most likely won't be getting played uh, if there's like a Naya Feather deck. Maybe there. Um, there is like Thrash Threat in the format also, where like where Thrash is two mana and instant speed and deals the damage. It doesn't get a one one counter, but it's an instant. And also you have the threat part of it. So I feel like just Thrash Threat's gonna be a, a better card and be getting played instead of Domri's Ambush. So I see they're just limited. Uh Thrash does hit planeswalkers. Um yeah. Okay. Uh, Dovin's Veto is white and a blue and a white for an instant. Can't be countered and counter target non creature spell. Wow. This is one of the most surprising cards in the entire set to me. Negate is a very good card and a perfectly reasonable card. And I am, I'm honest, I was honestly really surprised when I read this card and saw that they printed an upgrade to negate. Um, this, yeah, I'm just, just really surprised. So, like, is this an A? Is this, like, Mortify level, like, where you're thinking, like, Dovin's Veto, and Dovin's Veto is everywhere? Um, you know, uh, it's certainly, yeah, Dovin's Veto is certainly playable in older formats. Yeah. Yeah, e Eternal formats, too. Um, I don't know if it's going to be like the thing about like the format staples, like those are, you know, we're talking about like main deck cards. I don't know how much main deck play Dovin's Veto is going to see. It will see some, 
you know, like, but I expect it to be like a, a two of in like Esper control decks. Like they usually play like two negates main, you know, like this isn't like a four of main deck kind of card. Um, yeah, like it is, it is main deckable. Dovin's Veto is because yeah, negate certainly uh, main deckable right now, but um, I this is going to be like your blue white decks are going to have like four of them in the 75 kind of thing. <laughs> you know, like this is this is like a four of them in the 75. Azorius Aggro, absolutely. Um, yeah, Azorius Aggro would be playing this card. Uh, so I think it's better than a B. I think it's better than just a very common cyborg card because it, and I think, but I don't think it's like an A. I don't think it's a format staple. So it's either A minus or B plus. Is it closer to format staple or is it closer to very common sideboard card? You know, like I would put like duress negate for the most part as Bs. So I think I'm going B plus here because I think it's just like a, a very common sideboard card that's like a four of sideboard card that will see a little bit of, of main deck play, but it's not going to see a ton of main deck play, I don't think. Um, so I'll, I'll go with a B plus for Dovin's Veto, uh, considering our grading scale. How you know? But it's very. It is going to be like a four of sideboard in every. You know, or at least four of in the 75 of basically every blue white deck. <laughs> you know, um, it's this is going to be a, a very common card to see. So maybe maybe that makes it a minus. Then, all right, I'm going I'm going a minus. All right, talking through it, y'all convince me. Um, we'll go a minus. It is it is terrible against creature decks. That is true. Because you know, it, it can't can't do anything against a creature. <clears throat> okay, Dread Horde Butcher. Red or uh, black and a red one one haste. Whenever Dread Horde Butcher deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, put a one one counter on Dread Horde Butcher. When Dread Horde Butcher dies, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. Hey, good afternoon, QQ. So the problem with Dreadhorde Butcher, okay, well, let's start with the good part. So if you you know get to play this on turn two and your opponent does not have a blocker, you get to hit your opponent with this and turn it into a 2-2 two -two immediately. And then whenever it will die, it will deal two damage to any target. That's not a bad card for two mana. You know, so it's like, so basically if you think about like a 2-2, a two, -two, a two mana 2-2 two -two that ETBs and deals one damage to the opponent... And then also has, um, whenever it dies, you know, you'll deal damage that, that much power to any target. Or you, whenever it dies, you'll deal two damage to any target. And it ha and it can grow also. You know, it's that's pretty nice. Like, that's a good card. And so if you can reliably have this on turn two where you, you are hitting your opponent with it and growing it, it's a good card. The problem is, is drawing this card later in the game, it's going to be pretty bad. Whenever whenever you, your opponent has creatures on the battlefield to block it. Like, let's say you're on the draw. Your opponent plays a Wild Growth Walker on turn two. This card does kind of nothing. Like, what are you going to do? Attack at that Wild Growth Walker and have it die and deal one other damage to it? Kind of thing. Um, <laughs> play this with... Play Dreadhorde Butcher with Thud. Um... Oh, really? Dreadhorde Butcher stole Spawn of Mayhem's Mace? That Spawn of Mayhem's Mace there? That is pretty cool. It's just too fast. It's too hasty. Um, it does need... it. Yeah, so it needs some help. Um, because, like, if your opponent has creatures to block it, it's not so good. But, yeah, as y'all are saying, uh, get it with Judith. It, it gets it a lot better because Judith already pumps up the power to be two. Um basically you want it so it's not just a footlight fiend you know like if it's footlight fiend for two mana you know it's going to be horrible and there's going to be times like when the battlefield is is um jumbled up and you don't have you don't have the ability to attack in you don't have your judith in play there are definitely times like where this is going to be uh just footlight fiend um a good part or a good thing about dread horde butcher is rakdos two drops these days are pretty bad like the two drops that we have in Rakdos none of them 
are ones that are really exciting that you just like absolutely love kind of thing in like a Rakdos aggro deck. So Dreadhorde Butcher is can be that though. It can be an exciting two drop that can take over. A uh, really good card to play right before Judith. You know, you hit them, put it, turn it into a 2-2. Your next turn you play a Judith, and now it's a 3-2. You hit them again, now it's a 4-3. And then they Kaiser Ather Battlefield, but then you deal 5 damage to them uh, with your Butcher. That's exciting. Um, that's, that's like the best case scenario. So we're really looking at like a Rakdos Aggro deck that, card that's like really good against control kind of thing. Uh, against other creature decks, it can make combat pretty messy if it's if it's more than like a one one you know like if it's like a two one that you know can deal two damage plus an extra one like if you have the judith out it can make com then it can make even blocking kind of messy how you can deal the, the extra damage uh different places so i'm going with a c with um dread Horde butcher i think this is you know it's a powerful card that can see some playing some fringe archetypes for now uh, until we really see these Rakdos aggro decks break out. They're basically just fringe archetypes right now. Um, you know, so yeah, Priest of Forgotten Gods, of course, can, you know, does, you know, helps you in this kind of deck also. Um, so I think, I think I'm going with a C here for Dread Horde Butcher. It is good. Yeah, with Death Baron also. Death Baron, uh, if there is, if you, do end up playing a black red zombie deck um this works really well in a black red zombie deck absolutely again powerful card fringe archetype kind of thing um you know gruesome menagerie also yeah there may be enough there for a for a highly played archetype but we haven't we haven't seen that yet Elite Guard Mage, two white and a blue for a 2-3 flying. When Elite Guard Mage enters the battlefield, you gain three life and draw a card. I mean, it's not bad. Gain three life, draw a card. Um, it's pretty nice. Is this, like, good enough for standard? If we talk about how good all of the cards in standard are, are we playing Elite Guard Mage anywhere? I'm not so, sh not so sold on that. We play like a Bant Vanifar deck. Uh, Bant Vanifar's four drops are pretty bad in general. And this can turn your, your three mana, you know, Jaylight Ranger or whatever. You go find an elite guard mage, gain three life, draw a card. Um, you know, it's obviously a very fringe archetype, but that's this could fit fill in that slot because like the four drops that we have in the Bant colors, there's not like a great, there's not like a lot of value ones that you want to get with Prime Speaker Vanifar right now. <clears throat> um... Oh yeah, a yeah, great and limited, great and limited. Um, yeah, I mean this this does work with time wipe. How you can play this and gain life, draw a card, and block, and then pick it up for time wipe. But it, you know, do you really? Is it better than other things you can put in your deck? You know, you can have chemistry's insight in your time wipe deck, kind of thing. Um, so I think this is similar to Basilica Bell Hunt. Well, Basilica Bell Hunt does. You know, it is a lot better body against a red deck kind of thing of like a 3-4 is a lot better than a 2-3 flying. Like that's, there's a huge difference in that, that fourth point of toughness kind of thing. If this was like a 2-4, I would like it more, but 2-3. Um. <clears throat> well, yes, Chupacabra and Hostage Taker in your Vanifar deck, those those do not go in a Bant deck, uh, Thunderwunk. You know, Bant is blue white and green and you cannot play well i mean you can but you probably should not play chubacabra or hostage taker in your band deck um so yeah this is um yeah these are going to be uploaded on youtube yep all the other ones we did all the other all the normal colors we did yesterday we were on the multicolor right now uh so probably not play i'm going with this is i'm calling this just a limited card i don't think this will see standard play but there is a chance that it could fill some kind of, you know, uh, role uh, that some deck needs. So it could be a D, but I'm I'm just gonna go give it the limited range or limited rating. Sorry though, I'm give it a limited rating though. All right, we have Enter the God Eternals, two blue, blue, black sorcery. Enter the God Eternals deals four damage 
to target creature and you gain life equal to the damage dealt this way. Target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard and then amass four. I really like this card. Um, you know, we're looking at, especially when you don't have other amass cards, we kind of talked about this yesterday when we were talking about amass cards. The first amass card, I believe, is, you know, better and they have diminishing returns. Because whenever you're, I don't think it's, like, I don't think putting four 1-1 one, one counters on a creature is as valuable as making a 4-4. Four, four, for the most part. Um, but, yeah, it does mill the gods. I, I don't think that that, you know, I don't think that that's, like, a huge reason to play it. But if you're looking at playing a 5-mana 4-4, four, four, deals 4 damage to a creature, you gain 4 life, kind of thing. Uh, you know, looking at, at that part, you know, there is, like, the mill 4 part to it also. Uh, you were looking at, it's kind of like Ravenous Chupacabra gain four for an extra mana. Uh, so blue-black decks can definitely struggle with aggro. At the very least, I think, like, if you're playing, like, a Demir midrange deck, like, mono-red is good, is usually really tough for Demir midrange. Even for Grixis, mono-red's tough. You don't have very much gain, gain life in um, those kind of decks. And so, like, you know, you get to play... It is five mana, but gain four life is pretty critical. And then, you know, kill your Chain Whirler or, um, you know, whatever also. Um. <laughs> it is... Uh, and then, yeah, also with, like, the yeah new Kefnet, if you're playing, like, a, a mid-range deck with a new Kefnet where you want instants and sorceries or, you know, search for Escanta, like, where you're... Where, Something like that where you're trying to play a lot of instants and sorceries, where this gives you like a creature body there. Basically, I think I a couple of people are saying this is unplayable. I don't think this is unplayable at all. I think that this has its role um, in you know certain archetypes where I I can certainly see having a blue black based deck where I need some life gain uh, for mono red and there isn't really other life gain options in like blue black and this can be that and it also you know is a removal spell and a good body you know four four body against mono red is good like you know it dodges the um dodges removal spells it can you know end the game kind of quickly five turn clock kind of thing um yeah so like does like esper control play it probably not like, Esper Control already has, like, some good life gain. They have a lot of good removal. They have a lot of good spells. Like, they're probably not playing this. Is, like, a blue-black mid-range playing this? Absolutely. Yeah, I think this could be a blue-black mid-range card. Whether, you know, maybe it's just sideboard. Maybe it's not main deck. Um, like, Grixis Control, maybe. Yeah, like, Grixis, Grixis can certainly struggle with life gain. I could see... Um, I don't think I would necessarily start with this in my Grixis Control sideboard. But if I'm struggling with red and want something else, this is certainly a good card to turn to. Um, is it dead if they don't have a creature? Uh, yes, you do have to... It does deal 4 damage to target creature. There does have to be a creature to target. So yes, if there's no creature on the battlefield, if you already used a bunch of removal spells, then yes, this isn't going to do anything. You can have your own creature if you'd like. You know, you can deal 4 damage to your own creature. Um, but yeah. So, Enter the God Eternals. Um, I'm probably going with like a C minus, like a fringe, probably like a fringe sideboard card, I guess. Well, that, I guess fringe sideboard card is like a C uh, card that you'll see in the in the format, but maybe even a little like a C minus kind of thing. Um, can you cast this with Shalai on the battlefield? Yes, you would have to target yourself to mill four though. Because it's target player. So you would you would deal four damage to the Shalai, and you would gain four life, and you would mill yourself for four. Um, yeah, so this is is comparable to a, a, a five mana four four. If the milling yourself is good, this makes this card even better, too. If you can like mill yourself uh for you know pretty good value. You know, like if you're playing Chemistry's Insights and stuff like that in like your uh Kefnet deck, like a blue black Kefnet deck with a lot of instants and sorceries, and you have like a good reason why you want to mill yourself because of jump start cards. Uh, it does make this just even better. And yeah, this is a this is a creature you can find off Ascanta. Yep. 
and you know just mill yourself for yeah be able to flip your Escanta basically right away also. So I, I'm going C. Let's go C. Let's move it up a little bit. Some people have like uh, <clears throat> yeah, a lot of people say it's a B. Um, I don't think it's going to be highly played, kind of thing. I'll go with the C. All right, Feather the Redeemed. Red, white, white, 3 4 flying. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets a creature you control, exile that card instead of putting it into your graveyard as it resolves. If you do, return it to your hand at the beginning of the next end step. Uh, I'm going to real quickly answer another question here. So, whenever you would target your own 1 1 zombie army with Enter the God Eternals, you would kill that army because you deal four damage to it and then you would make a new army that would be that would have a four four you know be a four four army all right so feather the redeemed this card looks really cool and there's there's a lot of good things that work well with this we were talking about this earlier uh or i guess yesterday uh you know but in the red section when we were talking about um uh, what was the name of that card? The Arcanist. Dreadhorde, Dreadhorde Arcanist, I believe. Um, I do think that there's going to be a, a Boros Heroic deck. Uh, when we talk, And also, um, uh, what's the other red card that goes with it as well? Krenko? Yeah, we're talking about like Krenko, uh, Dreadhorde Arcanist, and... Aurelia. There's going to be another. There's another creature here uh, later on um, in this set. There we go. Tenth District Legionnaire. Perfect in that kind of deck. This this card certainly makes that deck also. Um, but I, that does look to be a real deck. Now, do you want to go three colors instead of just Boros? Maybe not. Like there seems to be enough in in Boros to make that a real deck. But I could certainly see that being a, a highly played deck. So I feel like this is this is just a B. I think this is very similar to Gatebreaker Ram from the last um, set, where this is just going to be a a defining card in like a highly played archetype kind of thing. But that does look like a, you know, the Boros uh, Heroic deck does look like a real deck. Um, and uh, yeah, you can play, yeah, Quasi-Duplicate, yeah, you can, you can quasi duplicate this, but the the problem with quasi duplicating this, you do get your quasi duplicate back, but the token you make is also legendary and then just dies. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to quasi duplicate it, but you can keep doing it if you want, <laughs> even though it doesn't really do anything. All right. So other things about this deck that a lot of people are pointing out that it is an angel. And so is this going in like a Boros Angels or Jeskai Angels with Dive Down? to be able to have dive down, protect your angels and everything like that. Um, <clears throat> I believe you can jumpstart it, like maximize velocity and then return it, I believe, but I'm not 100% sure. I don't know exactly how that goes, but I, I think that I saw something that jumpstart, they wanted jumpstart to work with this. All right, somebody in chat saying, no, that, does, that jumpstart does not work with this. Um... Anyway, yeah, this with Dive Down is really nice. You know, you get to keep protecting it with Dive Down. Now, is it really good enough for, like, a, a Mardu Angels? Or, like, are you playing this in just a regular uh, Angels mid-range deck? Which, as y'all know, I play tons of Mardu... Or, sorry, tons of Angel mid-range decks. So, like, is this going in, like, the Mardu Angels, you know, with Seraph of the Scales and Aurelia and Lyra and everything like that? It's another three-mana Angel. It's like, yeah maybe like a couple copies because it is legendary and if you're not having if you're not playing the instance and sorcery spells to target your own creature if you're just trying to play a uh, mid-range angel deck three mana three four flying is is not spectacular you know it doesn't you know not doing anything else it, it's not spectacular it's not like a four of kind of thing especially with it being legendary so it does get like the the lira pump of course but you know, maybe like a two of just to fill the, the three mana slot is like where I would kind of look at it in Mardu Angels kind of thing. <clears throat> um, 
is it better than history banalia for that that kind of deck maybe but the fact that it's legendary you're not really playing four of in that kind of deck because it's not it's not going to be vital to your strategy but however in the boros heroic deck that should be a brand new archetype that looks to be a very real archetype and feather the redeemed a big part of it so calling it a b What's your opinion about Boros drawing cards every turn? I don't really know. Like every every deck draws a card a turn, right? Like you're that's what your draw step is for. Oh yeah, you're just talking about it with yeah, with Defiant Strike. Yeah. It's it's certainly good with Defiant Strike. Um that I mean Defiant Strike will be part of that Boros Heroic deck. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, and yeah, feather feather does survive solar blaze, and you know same with Aurelia and Shalai. So if if you want to start playing solar blaze, yeah, uh, it does. You know, works well with deafening Clarion. Feather Redeem does how it it does survive deafening Clarion, and the Clarion can give it life link. Uh, I think that's where you're kind. Of, I think you would be looking maybe more towards deafening Clarion than solar blaze. I'm just I'm not really sold on solar blaze, but we'll talk about that card later. All right, Gleaming Overseer. Uh, one blue, black, one four. Whenever it enters the battlefield, a mass one. Zombie tokens you control have hexproof and menace. Hmm. So, you know, this is kind of just for a blue, black zombie deck. Uh, it's a very good defensive card, being a one four, but, you know, then it makes your things have menace. So you want them to be, you know, attacking and everything. I I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing. Uh, I think Gleaming Overseer is just a limited card. Um, I'm not really seeing it here. It's like if again we talked about like how if you have like a ton of amass stuff, they kind of they're kind of worse. Like let's say you already have like a three three army, and so you play your Gleaming Overseer, and it's. You get for three mana you get a one four and then you make your thirty three into a four four. And then that, that four four is has hexproof and menace. Is that like good enough for a card with all like the powerful things you can be doing in standard? I don't think so. So I'm going with the limited rating for Gleaming Overseer. Heartwarming re- Heartwarming Redemption. Two red and a white instant. Discard all of the cards in your hand, then draw that many cards. Uh, plus one. Sorry. I thought I missed something there. So, sorry. Let's restart this. Discard all of the cards in your hand, then draw that many cards plus one. You gain life equal to the number of cards in your hand. This is kind of cool. You know, it does let, it lets you rummage your entire hand away plus draw an extra card. So, it's, it is instant speed card draw. Uh, in red white which doesn't usually have instant speed card draw kind of thing the problem is is like where where are we really playing this like are so are we going to put this in like our our angel mid-range deck kind of thing where like the fact like whenever you have any card in your hand that you like that you want pretty bad are you ever actually casting heartwarming redemption you know like probably not so maybe Jeskai. So if we're if we're playing a Jeskai deck where we actually have some other instants and everything, do we actually want this card over Chemister's Insight? I don't I don't think so. I think we'd rather just have Chemister's Insights and draw cards and things like that. Um, it's <laughs> Red White Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, I mean Red Red White Phoenix Jeskai Jeskai Arclight Phoenix, where we can discard a bunch of Arclight Phoenixes. You do need the discard card, all the cards in your hand part to be pretty valuable to want to play this card. If if you can somehow make that discard really valuable, then you know then you can start talking. Um, if you're yeah if if you're like having a bunch of cards that are good in your graveyard basically, um, maybe you have uh, a Mardu deck where you have gutter bones and you can discard your gutter bones discard you know if you're playing cards like uh squee and you want to discard your squee and you can re- still recast it um i so petty says that 
they think this could be played in the feather deck the boros feather deck and i i'm not really seeing it i don't think so i think like there's a lot of very good cards in standard you know like four mana there's there's a lot of good things i think this is just a limited card but i think the only way you can really play this is if discarding all the cards in your hand is valuable to your deck somehow you know like somebody was saying like an arc light phoenix deck you know maybe my name is london thanks to that tier one sub thank you so much there london all right bump up our sub count on the day here sub number four All right, Huatli's Raptor. Green and a white, 2-3 Vigilance. ETB Proliferate. Hmm, it's kind of cool. Like, a 2-3 Vigilant body for two is not bad. There's there's not a lot of, like, amazing two drops in standard uh, kind of thing. That's decent, yeah. If you're, like, this seems to work pretty well with the new Ajani. They can put a bunch of 1-1 one -one counters and all your things. I think this I'm still gonna give this the limited rating. Like I don't think like the token like a token deck would actually play this. Like I don't think I don't think this will actually see play. I'm gonna give this a limited rating also, but it's not a bad card. Like it's it's a card to think about, you know, like if you need um a defensive two drop in a green white deck and you have a bunch of one one counter stuff or planeswalkers, then Huali's Raptor could see could be your dinosaur, you know. It can be. So you know, maybe a D here, but I th think it's still just limited because it's not going to be like a build around janky kind of card. Um, question here is how valuable is proliferate going to be? And I don't expect it to be very valuable. Um, play, play it in Naya, a Naya riot deck or play it with Justicer's portal. Like, yeah, there's, there's things you can do with this deck. It, it does work very well with the, um, it works perfectly with four mana Ajani, the the old one, um, Ajani, adversary of tyrants, because Ajani can, um, you know, put counters on stuff, and then you play your Hawali's Raptor, and then you proliferate the counters and put a counter on your Ajani, and also how it can return a creature with CMC two from your graveyard to your battlefield, and Huali's Raptor is a pretty good one. You can, you know, minus two, bring back your Huali's Raptor, proliferate, put a counter back on your Ajani kind of thing. And then you have like this creature to block for it. So maybe if if you, you know, want something, if you, if, you know, you need a two drop for like a Selesnya mid-range deck, you know, with Ajani's, um, you know, like with both Ajani's basically, and you're trying to go wide, uh, maybe this can do something. So I guess I guess we'll go with like a D then. Green white explore. Yeah, put some counters on your explore creatures and your wild growth walker. But like does this does this fit? Like your uh, so your green white explore, like you're already playing wild growth walkers and merfolk branch walkers and you probably have landwar elf and jade light ranger. And then you know you have like your other you have like your interactive spells like your removal and stuff and you have your your top end of your like planeswalkers and your johnnies and your vivians and everything. Is there room for Huatli's raptor? I don't really see it. So I'll go with the D though, still. With Pelt Collector, um yeah. Yeah, you could play Pelt Collector on one, turn two, you play this, you put the counter on Pelt Collector, and then you proliferate and you have a you have a three three already. Yeah, you could do that. There are so there are there are certainly cool interactions you can do with the card, but does that mean it's worth one of the year slots for your 75 cards that you're sleeving up in your standard deck? That's a that's a tough question. All right, invade the city. All right, I guess yeah, bant ascendancy. That that could be a real I think a bant a, a janky bant simic ascendancy deck is where you could really see Huali's Raptor. That could be a thing. Um, invade the city one blue and a red sorcery uh, no I, I'm not writing down the ratings as we go also um, 
I guess I wish I would have had like a Google Google Doc with like all of the cards because I could just type like the rating in also. But no, I don't. I don't have like the ratings written down. Um, as we were saying this earlier, if somebody would like to go to the the YouTube channel and just kind of play it on two x speed and and write down the ratings for the card. So that would be uh, that'd be very appreciative that we could have to be able to share. Um, and I, I may go back and do that later on. Uh, but while we're doing this here, um, like when it's easier to have a copy paste list of all the cards in the set. <clears throat> all right, invade the city. One blue and a red sorcery, a mass X, where X is the number of instants and sorcery cards in your graveyard. So we've seen a lot of blue and red cards that care about like creatures that care about how many instants and sorcery cards you you have in your graveyard or like how many you're playing kind of thing. There are just tons of these kind of cards. This is just a a a style that they just keep hammering home for is it. The thing that I like about Invade the City as opposed to like all of the creatures that say like put a counter on your thing or give it plus 1 plus 0 whenever you cast it or anything like that. The thing that I like about Invade the City is that it's a spell. And whenever you're whenever you want a deck with a critical number of instants and sorcery spells, having a sorcery spell that cares about that is really nice. It's a lot better than having a creature cuz when you have your creature in your hand, it, it's not an instant and sorcery spell. So it doesn't help with your other, you know, it doesn't help itself kind of thing. Um, so it's, so that's kind of cool how you can, you know, just play a ton of instants and sorcery spells. And then you play another sorcery, like invade the city, invade the city that makes a really big creature. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, like later on you have another invade the city that, you know, counts the first invade the city. Cause it was a sorcery kind of thing. So that's, that's pretty cool. And it, it can make, you know, really big creature, you know, three mana, you know, you're playing like an eight, eight, you're playing a nine, nine, you're playing a 10, 10 in the right kind of deck. That's pretty cool. The thing is, is like your creature is just a large creature. It doesn't have the evasion like crackling Drake has. And, um, which is a huge strike against it. You know, whenever you can sit there and chump block your big creature with like whatever, uh, other creatures, that's kind of tough. You know, it's something that dies to basically every creature removal spell. You know, cast down, mortify, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So, I, I think this this is just a limited card, but I, I do like the design of the card, how it is, how uh, how we talked about it, how it's like a sorcery that, that cares about instants and sorceries instead of a creature. But, still just a limited card. You know, we'd rather just be playing Crackling Drakes. All right, Leyline Prowler. One black and a green for a 2-3 Death Touch lifelink uh, that has tap, add one mana of any color. <laughs> this is a, a pretty cool card. I wish it cost two mana. Three mana for a mana creature is a lot. It does have Death Touch and Life Link, and that's pretty cool. So it can just kind of trade with anything. It can gain some life. Um, are we putting Leyline Prowler in our black green big mana deck with Death Sprout and Casualty of Wars? Maybe. Like maybe that's where we're maybe that's where we're going with it. Y'all are just saying limited card. It's it's probably just a limited card, but you know, Death Touch? does mean it trades with any other creature and it can add mana of any color so like do we need to have it in the Niv-Mizzet deck to like help us cast our Niv-Mizzet I don't know maybe lifelink can gain a little life I don't know it's a it's likely a limited card and I think that's what I'm going to give the rating to but it's an interesting card to think about and I could see it filling a role in some kind of deck um, you know it's kind of like gift of paradise kind of thing a similar kind of card um you know they they obviously are a little little different you know one being creature one being enchantment kind of thing but similar kind of card um because the ad yeah being able to add a man of any color is pretty important for if this card is going to be good kind of thing um yeah i mean there are cards with punch effects i mean yeah you have like domri Am ambush kind of thing uh, with this Domri, this Domri would fight, 
Um, so, you know, you could fight with your 2-3 death touch kind of thing. Um, but So I'm going to go with the limited rating again with Leyline Prowler, not expecting it to pick up waves in standard because of how good standard is. But it's a, it's a cool card. It's, it's a one that I'm glad they printed. And don't be surprised if I have this in some deck somewhere. All right, Living Twister, red, red, green, 2-5. One in a red, dis discard a land card. Living Twister deals two damage to any target. Green, return a tapped land you control to its owner's hand. Hmm. This is the kind of card that I should really like. Oh, let me put this, sorry. This is the kind that kind of card that I should really like, but I don't. So, <laughs> Sever says Living Twister plus Plaza of Harmony with a couple gates. You get to gain three life every turn. So you can return your gain three life land and then play it again. I just don't really see this how this card is how this card's going to actually make waves in standard. I don't really see how how we're building a deck around this. I mean, it's either going to be a D where you can build a janky deck around it, or it's an F, you know, with it being a rare where it won't see any play at all. Um, three mana, two, five is good defensive stats. If you want a, a creature to block against, against aggro. Could we put Living Twister in the sideboard of, like, the Gruul deck? Of just like regular gruel, could this be a cyborg card against aggro at just being a two five? Um, that like you know, if you flood out, you just throw your land at somebody something to, to do some damage. Or, you know, you need to like kill something, you can. Hero says it, it could be a cyborg card for team or reclamation against aggro. It's kind of tough for them to have the red, red, green right away. Because, you know, like, that's a deck that's playing a lot of blue. Um, but I could see that. I could see them having that in their sideboard. And Shinjima says it works well with the new Nissa to, met, to net more mana. Yeah, I guess if you have a lot of forests. But, of course, you need red red in your deck. But then, then you'd also need a lot of forests. Um So, okay. Somebody says, with the new Nissa, it can save the lands that your opponent tries to hit with removal when you make the lands a 3-3. Three so that's, that's pretty cool. So yeah, like you're you know, making your lands 3-3s three that, that die in combat or die to removal spells is, is rough, but this can save them. It, you know, the, the lands do have to be tapped, but you can basically just tap any land right before you, before you bounce it. Um... All right, so I think I think that's where we're at. Maybe uh, a fringe cyborg card for some gruel decks, maybe to play against aggro, just being a two-five body for three that can kind of do some stuff a little bit. Isn't there already a two-five for three? Isn't like that other? Isn't there like that other dinosaur, R runic armosaur? Isn't that a two-five right now? I believe it is. Bleh. Yeah, so that was our... Okay, so that was already... A, a, so there already was... So 1GG for a 2-5. Whenever an opponent activates an ability of a creature or land that isn't a mana, mana ability, you may draw a card. So there already is a 3-mana 2-5 that doesn't see any kind of play. Um, that would be a sideboard card. And that has the ability to maybe draw some cards, like, you know, if the opponent, I don't know, activates their Siren Storm Tamer or whatever. So, yeah. Question is, do you think it realistic, it's realistic that this card can deal six damage on their end of turn and then three more on your untap? Not really. So late land shocks are better than... Um, Armasaur's ability. I mean, 
I guess. And I guess against aggro, you'd probably want to shock some things. The mana cost, though, is a whole lot rougher. Red, red, green. So I'm going with an F. I don't, I don't even think this is really a sideboard card against aggro. There's probably better things to be doing. So I'm going F. Mayhem Devil, one black and a red for a 3-3. Three, three. Whenever a player sacrifices a permanent, Mayhem Devil deals one damage to any target. Um, Zydroth has a good point. This card with Experimental Frenzy, you get to discard the lands in your hand whenever you're going with Experimental Frenzy. Still going F. The new set comes out on the 25th on Arena. All right, so you're... <laughs> so Natural Percent says that Mayhem Devil here is their favorite jank card in the set. They want to build it with Scape Shift, sacrifice all their lands, deal a whole lot of damage to different targets. Um, so yeah, the Devil, of course, yeah, that's the... The most straightforward thing is playing this with Priest of Forgotten Gods and Judith, and it is, you know, playing it with a uh, Bantu, um, where Bantu will, you know, when it, when Bantu ETBs, you can sacrifice any number of permanents and draw that many cards, and then you know you have your Mayhem Devil that can deal a bunch of damage. Um, yes, we have already reviewed the other, all the other colors. We're on multicolor right now. We did all the other colors last night, uh, but it just took us seven hours, so we ran out of time. <laughs> so you can check it all out there on the YouTube channel if you want to see the green tutor it's in there um, so there are, there are certainly some janky things you can be doing with Mayhem Devil as we talked about the straightforward thing going with uh, Judith uh, Priest of Forgotten Gods Bantu you know like a a red black sacrifice theme deck I don't think I think that's a pretty janky deck or like basically I don't think Mayhem Devil makes the cut i guess that's what i'm saying there's other good three drops like i think you're playing judith and i think you're playing uh, midnight reaper you know and stuff in instead of mayhem devil so i'm going with mayhem devil being a d um a janky build around card if, if you'd like to play it but i don't think this is uh really going to make waves and and i don't think you uh need to like i don't think you need to put this in like your regular rakdos aggro deck like i don't think it's going to be strong enough for that uh, Philip has another, that's a, that's something, yeah, if you play a, a treasure deck, okay, you want to play with Smothering Tithe, get a bunch of treasures, so, you know, you're, every time you sacrifice your treasure to your treasure map, or just sacrifice a treasure in general, you deal a damage somewhere, <laughs> there are definitely some janky things you can do with this, <laughs> that's pretty cool, um, all right, uh, yeah, a Grixis pirate aggro deck that makes a lot of treasures, and then you sack them with your devil. Okay, there you go. Um, <laughs> Mayhem devil is sideboard for the for the mirror. So like whenever your opponent activates their priest of forgotten gods, you get to do two damage to the the priest and have it kill the priest, and then you have to sack your Mayhem devil. <laughs> All right. Uh, Merfolk skydiver, blue and a green for a one one flying. Uh, when Merfolk Skydiver enters the battlefield, put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control, and you can pay 5 mana to proliferate. So do you want a 2 mana 2-2 two -two flying that can then proliferate later? Probably not. We have like, two, like you know, there's a lot of creatures in the format that are like 2 mana, small creature, blue creature that has like 5 mana to like draw 2 cards. You know, we have that or, you know, draw some cards. I think that's probably going to be better than, like, Proliferate anyway. But I think, so, like, let's look at our creature type. We have creature type Merfolk. Um, and so, yeah, actually, that's what some people are starting to say here. Um, we have creature type Merfolk. Is this, do you want this in your Merfolk deck? Maybe there, because it's a flying threat for Merfolk, it gives Merfolk some evasion like they merfolk already plays like river sneak herald i believe is the name of that card that has that's two mana that has unblockable maybe if we want to put this in merfolk get a flying creature um you know have like your your other merfolk one one counter synergies 
uh, between like the green two mana rare and Kumena. They can put counters on your creatures. Um, that is the bad part about the card, though. Merfolks have such an exorbitant amount of two drops. That's like what the whole Merfolk deck is, is just two drops. So having another two drop has so much competition there for the two mana slot. So like, you know, is this something you're going to want to play on like turn three, turn four, turn five kind of thing? It's not the it's not the worst. You know, putting a counter on something is kind of nice. So this may go in the Merfolk deck. May. I'm not sure. I don't have a ton of experience playing Merfolk myself uh, in standard of like... Do we want this card? Um, and good, good point. Fla this card is a flavor fail. Like, how are we having flying Merfolk? I guess because it's a mutant, it transformed into a flying creature. But why, why are Merfolk flying? Like, why are they flying around? So it's like a couldn't it, like this this could at least have a third creature type like how there's so many like all the Simic cards from the last set had like three creature types you know like jellyfish hydra beast can we be like a merfolk something else mutant like something with flying you know whatever you want to have with flying just call it a merfolk you know drake mutant or whatever um and then, and then you can be like, okay, well, yeah, like they mutated merfolks and drakes together and they have like this thing or, you know, whatever, whatever other thing that flies. Merfolk bird, merfolk fairy, merfolk angel. <laughs> I don't think it's an angel. Um, but yeah, so uh, I rating, rating this one's kind of hard. Uh, I guess I'm just going to go with the limited rating that it won't see play, but it it could be a card for the Merfolk deck, maybe. Um, all right. Neoform. A green-red sorcery. As an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice a creature. Then search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost equal to 1 plus the sacrifice creature's converted mana cost. Put that card onto the battlefield with an additional plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. Then shuffle your library. This card is sweet. We talked quite a bit about this card whenever we were talking about um, the blue and green colors already. Um, I love this with Fibblethip. I love uh, being able to sacrifice your one drop. Um, and it, your one drop could be the Arboreal Grazer. It's a great one drop to play, get an extra land drop, sacrifice this, go grab Fibblethip. Put Fibblethip into play. Where's my Fibblethip? This card works so, so well with Fibblethip. Because you get to go put Fibblethip into, into play and draw two cards. And also your Fibblethip's a 2-2 two -two, because Neoform puts the additional counter on it. So you get your 2-2, two -two, uh, draw two. That is awesome. Plus, Fibblethip's a really good card to sacrifice. You want to sacrifice, after you play your Fibblethip, you can sacrifice it to Neoform. Go get your three drop. It's perfect there. Um... You know, it's it's basically just like some more Prime Speaker Vanifar activations, but you get the one one counter on it. Um, it's pretty cool. It's yeah, it's the non boltable Vanifar. Uh, I like this card quite a bit. So blue green, um, and then plus probably a third color, whether you want to go like Bant or Sultai. You know, make a deck where you are playing like a, a toolbox deck. You know, like just. Uh, you, know, you can have like your Kral Harpooners also like to be able to go get, go sacrifice. A lot of good things to, to do with this card. Um, so I'm going to go with... <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, it's it's basically Eldritch Evolution. You know, except for, you know, it only only adds one to the CMC and you get a 1-1 one, one counter on your creature. So it's basically Eldritch Evolution there. Um <clears throat> but Eldritch Evolution, of course, added two. This only adds one. So I think this is, you know, maybe a little less than a C. You know, C is like the uh, powerful card in Fringe deck. It's kind of this, but maybe a little less. So maybe a C minus. C minus to a C here. Uh, yeah, you do get the, yeah, Incubation Druid with 1-1 counter. Absolutely. That's another two drop you can get um, that you can start adding a bunch of mana with it. 
Um, so, yeah, that one, that one's pretty good. I, I like Neoform. I'm going to play some Neoform decks. Uh, yeah, I like the card. <clears throat> yeah, Growth Chamber Guardian also. Get a Growth Chamber Guardian, sacrifice your growth, you know, to go find another one, sack the Growth Chamber Guardian, you know. There's a lot of things to do with Neoform. All right. This is the card that a lot of people were waiting for. A lot of people were type, typing in real excited about Nickel Bolas Dragon God. Blue, black, 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 red. Nickel Bolas Dragon God has loyalty abilities of all other Planeswalkers on the battlefield. Plus one, you draw a card. Each opponent exiles a card from their hand or opponent they control. Minus three, destroy target creature or Planeswalker. Minus eight, each opponent who doesn't control a legendary creature or Planeswalker loses the game. Man, that art is amazing also. This card is sweet. This is going to be one of the very first cards that I play. The... <laughs> Gorms is limited at best. The biggest thing holding this card back from being really widespread play is the mana cost. Triple black and a blue and a red. You know, you have to just be just Grixis, and it's not really even splashable kind of thing. You know, it's not like colorless, colorless, blue, black, red, where maybe you can kind of play it in like a blue, you know, like some other deck, you know, I don't know. Um, it is much harder to cast than Teferi, yes. It is, I think this is a better, like, if you just look at, like, the two cards, if you kind of, obviously the, the mana cost is something, but if you just look at this and Teferi, side by side um just talking about five mana cards if they were equally as easy to cast if you ignore that i think bolus is a lot better card than teferi a lot maybe a little bit of a stretch but it's it's certainly better the plus one ability is the main reason why we we know how good like teferi's plus one ability is awesome untapping two lands we have seen to be incredible i think that this is even better I think that having your opponent have to exile a card from their hand or a permanent they control, get, getting rid of a resource from the opponent, that is awesome. You know, you were talking about basically every plus one being a disinformation campaign. You get to draw a card, they just discard a card or, you know, get rid of an extra land kind of thing. But like those things add up for sure. Um, that is like, you know, the second time you do it, getting rid of another one, like you you run out of permanents and cards pretty quickly, especially when you pair this with other card denial uh, or resource denial cards. When you're playing discard magic, magic, you know, you're playing duress, you're playing thought erasure, um, even disinformation campaign, like all those things, like they, do, they reduce the amount of resources in the game. You know, like a thought erasure is just a one for one trade, but you're both just getting rid of a resource, basically. You know, you get rid of your card from hand, you're getting rid of a resource from them. You know, removal spells are the same kind of thing. But you just keep doing that. You, you just have decks built on reducing the resources your opponent has. And then each tick up ability, gaining a resource for yourself and getting rid of a resource from the opponent, that is huge. Thank you so much, Bobby. Thank you for that um, Twitch Prime sub there. So it has that ability. It has... It has the ability to come down and destroy anything um, right away with, like, the minus three. Um, the other thing is it it does have that top part. If there are other Planeswalkers on the battlefield, you can do, you know, kind of anything with this. Um, is the minus three worse than Teferi's? Yes. I do think the minus three is worse than Teferi's. Yes. I think, being, I think tucking any permanent is better than destroying just a creature or a planeswalker yes the minus eight teferi's minus eight basically wins the game almost all the time you know they can't have hexproof things that you can't exile uh this minus eight i assume you only do this minus eight whenever your opponent doesn't have the legendary creature or planeswalker so you just automatically win the game um of course, there's the synergy with Elder Spell with Nicol Bolas that's incredible. Um, 
Oh, yeah. I mean, Thought Erasure is just, yeah, Thought Erasure, you know, Tony says here the Thought Erasure is going to be insane in the new standard, right? Like, I mean, Thought Erasure is just one of the very best cards in standard already, and it's it's just even better with Nickel Bolas Dragon God kind of thing. But yeah, Thought Erasure is awesome. Yeah, and somebody says here, don't sleep on that top ability. Yeah, yeah, you have that that top ability there also that, that can certainly do just do, you know, kind of anything. Um. I don't think the minus eight is worse than Teferi's because, I mean, winning the game is is as valuable as a thing that you can possibly have in a game. It's just winning the game. And that's what the minus eight does. You know, It doesn't win the game all the time, but if it doesn't, you're going to be doing one of the other abilities kind of thing. So, so yeah, we're going to be playing... Uh, this is going to be like the first deck that we're going to try out on Thursdays. We're going to be trying Nicol Bolas, Dragon God in... A Grixis control deck. Um, I think I'm going to start with it with Disinformation Campaign because I I do like how Disinformation Campaign does reduce resources also, and then like this plus ability reduces even more resources kind of thing. I like that quite a bit. Uh, whether we keep it with with Disinformation Campaign or not, if we move away from Campaign, you know, will be seen. You know, got to got to try out the card first. Um. Question is, is this best in a mid-range or a control deck? I mean, either one. I mean, it works perfectly in either one. Yeah, I, either. Um. <laughs> yeah, if if your opponent has a Teferi out, you can play your Nicol Bolas and tuck their Teferi, remember, because you, you, know, you can kill their Teferi if you want, or you can tuck it, you know, or if, like, they have a Teferi and they have... Like, if they have their Teferi out and they have, like, whatever enchantment and you're like, oh, man, I have this Grixis deck that can't deal with enchantments, well, boom, you can just now tuck their enchantment with your Nicol Bolas kind of thing. Um, yeah, this card's this card's awesome. There, I do like how there's, you know, while it does look really powerful, a couple of things are going to hold it back. The mana cost is really tough, how we talked about. That's going to hold the card back from just seeing widespread play. And number two, there are just a lot of good, cheap answers, like kind of specifically designed for Nicol Bolas in the set. They are kind of all with black, but we have, we've seen, of course, Elder Spell, a card like Despark. Um, there's the black card that like removes five loyalty counters from a Planeswalker, whatever whatever that card is named. Um, but that is kind of just has this card in mind. Um Whatever that card is named. Isn't that's a card, right? Remove five loyalty counters from something. Price of betrayal. Am I just missing it? There we go. Price of betrayal. There we go. I was just missing it. Remove five counters. So like that's you know, after a nickel bull sticks up, goes to five. You know, this is like a one mana answer to it. Um and uh so there there are some cheap things uh, of course there's the we talked about like the at the beginning of this video and grass rampage good two mana answer to it also it does seem like most of them are in the black color combination for a cheap like one to two mana way to get rid of a nickel bolus dragon god um also but yeah this card the art is incredible it looks incredible it is just the it is the card of the set it is an A. Uh, this is a defining. Uh, this is a format staple, basically. Yeah, so this, this is certainly an A. We haven't gone through the lands yet. Uh, this, is, this is Wizard's own website here that we're using right now. <clears throat> like there, this is Wizard's card gallery. All right, Niv Mizzet Reborn. White, blue, black, red, green for a 6 6 flying dragon avatar. When Niv Mizzet Reborn enters the battlefield, reveal the top 10 cards of your library for each color pair. Choose a card that's exactly those colors from among them. Put the chosen cards into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. I love this card. I definitely want to make a Niv-Mizzet deck. 
I don't know exactly how I want to do it. I, I'm kind of feeling like a couple different options, basically like Esper control with Esper having a lot of, like there's a lot of good blue, black and white, black and blue, white cards. So kind of like Esper control that's splashing red and green and, you know, splashing some other, some other cards with the, the red and green stuff. Um, I don't know if maybe you can go there. You can go, you can also go like base green with like a bunch of like the green add one man of any color kind of thing and green, green mana fixing with Niv and go more ramp heavy with go Niv Mizzet and then like some more expensive spells that you can grab after Niv Mizzet. I just think this card is really cool. I want to play this card. Um, Chromatic Lantern is certainly the, the number one card that is just like a no, no doubt, uh, card to play with with Niv Mizzet. You know, Chromatic Lantern uh turns all your lands into five color lands, makes casting Niv Mizzet very easy. It's, you know, your three mana artifact. I think for the most part, you know, you get to look at the top ten cards. You get to put cards for each color pair. Um I feel like for the most part you can kind of like when you build your deck with Niv Mizzet in mind that you can kind of reliably think of that as like a draw three basically i feel like you're probably going to hit three out of your 10 cards you know you'll hit like three different color pairs pretty reliably um so yeah the okay can you explain that etb better it, it confuses you okay it is the the wording is really weird so basically you whenever you you uh Whenever Niv Mizzet enters the battlefield, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You look at ten cards um, in your li- at the top of your library. Oh, I would have I would have bricked here, but you look at the top 10, 10 cards of your library. I would have gotten in this old Grixis control deck. I would have gotten nothing. But for for every two color color pair, um, you can take a card from among them and put it into your hand. So basically, Oath of Kaya costs a white and a black. So if you see an Oath of Kaya, you can take an Oath of Kaya, and that would be your one white-black card. If you see a Rao, that's your one blue-red card. You can grab Rao. You can draw Rao. Nicol Bolas has three different colors. You cannot grab Nicol Bolas Dragon God with Niv Mizzet, because that has three different colors. But it's for every, like, basically it's a, it's a guild matter card. For every guild um, specific card, you can grab one, you can draw a card with it. So I think for the most part, you're looking at a draw three. And if we're talking about, like we have to jump through some hoops to cast this card, of course, with it being five different colors. But if we're talking about a five mana, six, six flying draw three, that is really, really good. So a couple of couple of cards, other cards that I haven't mentioned that y'all are talking about. So Neoform, yes, it works. It it could work really well with Neoform. You know, you sacrifice a four drop, go grab Niv Mizzet, um, especially if you have, you know, a multi, uh, a Neoform deck built around like even Prime Speaker Vanifar. You can sacrifice your Vanifar to go grab Neo- Niv Mizzet. Uh, you know, you can have a lot of dual color things like Knight of Autumn and uh, Deputy of Detention and, you know, just kind of build your creature value deck based around the multicolor things. You know, you got your Tristani. Um, we have, we'll have like Tulsum or later, but I don't, you know, you just keep, keep going around like the different color combinations, um, Izoni and things like that. So you can, you can do that. You can make a Niv Mizzet deck, Miz, Niv Mizzet deck there. Um, uh, <clears throat> you can also have this work with the reanimate spells. Um, if you just discard it to like different things or you, you mill it over, there's, there's a lot of self mill, a lot of, you know, like you can discovery self mill it kind of thing. Like there's a lot of self mill and then you can, you can have it re you know, get it from your graveyard with like the third chapter of Eldritch Reborn, um, or the, or concoct, you know, the, uh, connive concoct, you can get your Niv Mizzet with that, um, a lot of ways to cheat, cheat it in from your graveyard, basically. Um, I I don't know how Shalai works with this card. I don't know if Shalai counts as a green white card or just a white card. Honestly, I don't I don't know that. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Shalai is just white? Okay. <clears throat> so, this is a card that I'm going to be building some decks around and trying it out. Is it going to be like a highly played... Is Niv-Mizzet going to be part of a highly played deck in the format? Probably not. Probably not. So, I'm going with a C for this. It's a powerful card that you can have in a fringe deck kind of thing. So I'm going to see with Niv Mizzet, but it's it's one that I I really like. Um, other other thing, oh yeah, it's, other people were saying for the legendary decks. How I like to make legendary decks with Kamal's Druidic Vow. You know, you cast your Kamal's Druidic Vow for five. You find your Niv Mizzet. You play your Niv, you know you get your Niv Mizzet off your Kamal's Druidic Vow. Absolutely, it's a it's a legend, so it works well there. Um, all right, what are the best ways to make rainbow mana? The the best way right now is um chromatic lantern that's the absolute best there are some other things like there are like gift of paradise uh paradise druid also um from the uh from the set paradise druid leyline prowler um there's the horizons card that's just like gift of paradise whatever that horizons card is named um there's some art other artifacts um in particular, uh, this Fire Mines Vessel, of course, works well with Niv Mizzet. It has Niv Mizzet um, in mind. I'm not sure if this is good enough to see play, but maybe. You know, four mana, you get to add two mana of any colors. If you kind of think of a circuitous route at four mana that adds two lands, you know, this is the same kind of thing, but you get to add two mana of different colors to help you get, you know, play your, your two color spells. That, that that card is just built with Niv Mizzet in mind, so maybe that's like a one or a two of kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> all right. Next card. Oath of Kaya. Oh, Sark and Fireblood. I didn't. I did not think. I didn't really think of Sark and Fireblood. Yeah, Sark and Fireblood adds two mana of any color to cast a dragon. And that can cast Niv Mizzet. I did not even think of that. I uh, I gave Niv Mizzet a C. A powerful card for a fringe deck. <clears throat> All right, Oath of Kaya. One white, black, legendary enchantment. When Oath of Kaya enters the battlefield, it deals three damage to any target and you gain three life. When ever an opponent attacks a planeswalker you control with one or more creatures, Oath of Kaya deals two damage to that player and you gain two life. So I have a question about this. Does this stack? If your opponent attacks with two creatures, or let's say they attack you and a planeswalker, okay? Like, so let's say they have two creatures, they attack a planeswalker and attack you. Does it stack? Does it deal four to them and you gain two life and you gain four life? Does not stack. Good. That's what I thought. I, I thought it would make no sense for it to stack, but a couple of my friends were saying how it read, they thought it would stack. And I was like, no, this, that shouldn't stack. Okay, good. Um, anyway, I love this card. Uh, speaking of legendary decks, I really like legendary decks, and the three mana slot is kind of rough. Uh, removal is kind of rough in the legendary decks, and this fits perfectly. Uh, I think it's pretty odd that it deals three damage, to be honest, in black and white. I mean, I guess you have Soren's Thirst that deals damage in black. I'm, I'm actually... I'm kind of surprised that this card doesn't just do minus three, minus three to a creature and you gain three life is what I'm trying to say. But three damage to any target means you get to shoot, you know, you get to shoot planeswalkers with this. You have black, white burn that you get to deal damage upstairs with this card. Um, like it's, it's definitely better than because it can deal. I don't know about definitely, but that's probably better. They can deal damage to planeswalkers and to players, that's probably better than minus three, minus three. Um, so yeah, it's a three mana lightning helix that also has the upside of like every time they attack you, you get to gain another two life and deal two damage to them. That is awesome. This card is really good. I, I like this card quite a bit. Um, does like Esper Control play this? I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but probably. I mean, that's a lot of life gain. Like think about this against red, like deal three to like a red creature you gain three life and then every time they try to attack you with their red creature you gain two life every single time that is really good 
Um, yeah, this this card's just solid. Oh, it's only attacks on planeswalkers. Oh, oh, I thought it was a plane you or a planeswalker. Whenever they attack you or a planeswalker. All right, well, a little less solid. It only it's sorry, my bad. Y'all are all pointing that out now. Um, it only triggers on whenever you are, um, whenever they're attacking a planeswalker. So, yeah, I mean, even if they're attacking like your Teferi or anything. So, uh, Esper, maybe, maybe here. Definitely Super Friends deck. You know, I like play, I like making my, like, Esper Legends kind of decks, uh, a Super Friends heavy deck. Definitely there. You can, you can flicker it, um sometimes like you even like uh teferi's the oath of teferi that comes down and flickers a permanent and lets you um, activate your planeswalkers multiple times you know you can flicker your oath of kaya here but there are other things to to flicker it with um yeah the the attacking the planeswalker still matters quite a bit um yeah this card's just awesome it's just a really cool card this is a, a card I'm, I'm gonna be playing quite a bit uh as far as letter grade goes I see it being a B, a role player that sees play among multiple decks. Yeah, like that life gain is is real. I can see, even just see like mid range creature decks just playing this, um, that you know have just a couple planeswalkers. Because even without that second part, just three mana, deal three, gain three, and especially if you're like an attacking creature deck that like wants a removal spell that's not dead against control. Because even against control, this is still just three damage upstairs. You know, like so that's that's still reasonable. I feel like giving Othakaya a B. I like this card. All right, Pledge of Unity. One green, white, instant. Put a 1 1 counter on each creature you control. You gain one life for each creature you control. This is just a limited card. I even like your go wide, green, white deck. I. I don't think you're playing a Pledge of Unity at all. The only way I can possibly see you playing this card is as a sideboard card against a like a red deck where you can gain a lot of life, but you lose the you when you have a lot of creatures against the red deck, you're not losing that game kind of anyway. You lose cuz you only you play a couple of creatures and they burn them and they play like Goblin Chain Whirler kill your other things and they like kill you. And this doesn't really help there. Yeah, you have Unbreakable Formation, which you're gonna, which is gonna be a lot better than this. A Johnny is a lot better than this. Uh, you know, a Johnny costs one more mana, but you're just gonna be playing a Johnny. Uh, this is, yeah. So let's just go limited here. Okay, Ral Storm Conduit. Ugh, not a card I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Two blue and a red. For Loyalty Planeswalker, whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, Ral Storm Conduit deals one damage to target opponent or Planeswalker. Plus two, scry one. Minus two, whenever you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. All right, so we all know about expansion with this card, how... It's just basically built to have the infinite combo. How it works, if if for some reason you don't know about this infinite combo, all you need... Um, okay, well, Kaios, like, that that doesn't work. Okay, so what? how Kaios is saying it, like, that, that doesn't work. Um, so, yeah. So basically how this works is you need... You need a spell on the stack, and then you need you need to have two expansions. And if you just have any spell on the stack that expansion can copy, you play an expansion to copy the the spell, whatever spell it is. And then you have a second expansion copy the first expansion. What happens then is your second expansion resolves. It copies the first expansion, so it makes another expansion. And then that expansion, again, copies the first expansion that resolves and so on. You can continue to do that. You can continue to have your first, your second expansion copy your first expansion an arbitrarily large amount of times. And each time you do it, it deals one damage to your opponent. You cannot just use one expansion. 
someone was saying is just having like one exp- like just someone was saying you like they said in chat if you have like one spell and then you use the minus two here to you play an expansion you copy the expansion with the minus two here but that doesn't work because you can't you can't do this at instant speed so you have to do this minus two first you can't already have the other spell on the stack um so that's that's why that doesn't work there um <clears throat> so basically you, you need like two expansions now you can also have like double cast um is like another so you can have basically eight expansions because you can have your double casts also um kind of thing does it work with like two double cast um because you can minus two with an expansion to lock your opponent out of casting a spell i guess like if you just have one expansion in hand and you just minus two and then pass the turn, and then if your opponent casts a spell, then you get to then you get to win. If they don't cast a yeah, then you basically if you think your opponent's going to cast a spell by your end step, if you they think they're going to chemistry's inside or anything, you can just minus two, and if they let that resolve, and if you have one expansion in your hand, then you just get to pass the turn and see if they cast something. Um. But yeah, Ral looks awesome. Like that's that's certainly going to be um, a combo deck. A very a very common place to see this that a lot of people are talking about is just playing this in Teamer Reclamation as like another uh, way to win because you already want your expansion explosions in Teamer Reclamation, um, and uh, the minus two works incredibly well with Nexus of Fate also in Teamer Reclamation, where um, even if you don't have your expansions, uh, you just you know if you have like your your wreck your team or, or your uh, wilderness reclamation out you have like a nexus of fate in your hand that you're going to cast use the minus two cast your uh, go to end step cast you know untap your lands cast your uh, nexus of fate take an extra turn then take another extra turn also um so it's just it's just like a perfect card for for that deck um you would only need one expansion if your opponent casts a spell after you minus two that's the that's the only time you would need one ex- expansion, um, but an expansion plus a double cast would work also. Um, so, yeah, combo with this this card is awesome. How good is this card without any combo? Who knows? Like Scry One is not is not like particularly valuable, but it does go to six loyalty, and six loyalty is a lot of loyalty. It's hard to hard to kill a six loyalty planeswalker uh from turn four that's kind of hard um okay so somebody says can't you just have one expansion if you if you go minus two then cast expansion and then you opt in response well the problem is is you cannot cast expansion unless there's something on the stack expansion says copy something on this you have to have something on the stack to copy so you do have to have the spell on the stack first. You can't just play your expansion first. Um, oh, so you're saying cast the spell in response. Okay, so if you go minus two and in response to the minus two, you opt. But then the opt would resolve first. And then your minus two happens. And then you don't have your opt on the stack anymore to expansion copy. So that doesn't work either. If you just have one expansion, one opt, and the minus two, that doesn't work either. Uh, you can do minus two and then bane. Yes, you can have like a big bane fire if you'd like, or just a big big explosion to copy. You know, so like let's say you just have your one expansion, but you, you know you you already untapped with your Ral, you have a decent amount of mana. You can just cast. You can just minus two and then cast explosion for like you know three, at like seven mana. And then, co- or even if you have like six mana, uh, you know, cast explosion for two, and then copy it so you really get explosion for four. You know, deal four, draw four. That's that's really nice. There's a lot of lot of things to to do with this, um, but yeah, banefire is uncounterable if you want to do banefire for five plus with this, and you get to copy an uncounterable banefire. Yep, that works. Also, um. So a lot of things to do with this card. I'm not really looking forward to it myself. I feel like I'm going to die to this combo quite a bit or just die to this card quite a bit. Um, as far as like a rating 
goes. I feel this like this is kind of like a, a B, a singular highly played deck uh, is built around Ral or, you know, has the Ral combo in it. I don't think it just goes in a lot of different decks. Like, I don't think you're putting this in, like, Grixis midrange or Grixis control too much. I think you're just playing this, you know, with your expansion combo kind of thing, with your Reclamation Nexus. Um, with that being said, I could see me playing this card in a blue-red splash, whatever other color, like, you know, Grixis or... Jeskai or anything like that legend deck where I'm playing this with Karn's Temporal Sundering um, and you know can can copy like maybe Teamer maybe a Teamer legend deck where you can copy uh, Kamal's Druidic Vow and have a double Druidic Vow or copy Karn's Temporal Sundering um, I could see me doing that <laughs> um, yeah this yeah this does work with thousand year storm of course um but yeah deafening clarion is a good card to minus two and wipe the battlefield with um would this be good in is it phoenix or is it drakes probably not i think you'd rather have the five mana rowl even though it, it does cost five instead of four i think the five mana rowl's tick up ability is a whole lot better the five mana rowl you can use for removal also, your four mana slot is is kind of filled already with Phoenix and Crackling Drake being there. I think you'd rather have five mana rail there. So going with B for Rail Storm Conduit. Oh yeah, if you have the Niv that we already have in standard with Ral Storm Conduit, yeah, you just you just kill people pretty quickly. Bunch of machine guns, so many pings. Uh, Evolution Sage, I don't I don't remember. Uh, was Evolution Sage in in here? No, so it was it was in one of the other ones. So yeah, Evolution Sage. That was a single color card. You can find the replay of that. We did the single color cards yesterday. You can find that on the YouTube channel there. YouTube.com slash Todd Stevens MTG. <clears throat> All right, Ral's Outburst. Two blue and a red instant. Ral's Outburst deals three damage to any target. Look at the top two cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand and the other into your graveyard. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. So you get the you get five mana Ral's plus one trigger. You know, look at two two cards, put one in your hand, one in your graveyard. And you, and you have a removal spell here, deal three damage for four mana. Um, not so bad at all. That doesn't necessarily mean it's good enough to see play, I guess. Uh, you know, we have we have somebody here in chat says F. Um, with well, this being an uncommon, it would be limited rating, not F. But uh, I'm kind of leaning that way. I think this is maybe, I mean, maybe this is a, a roll filler in a blue-red spells deck. But, I mean, we already have, like... I mean, Beacon Bolt deals a whole lot of damage. This only deals three. Like, are you really playing this over Lightning Strike kind of thing? The the great... this Like, one saving grace about this card is at four mana instant speed, you get to hold up Chemister's Insight or Ral's Outburst, depending on, you know, which one you want to use kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, it is okay with Electromancer and Arclight-type decks. But is there anything in that deck that you're want to take out for Ral's Outburst? I can't really think of anything there. Uh, if we're talking about Teamer Reclamation, it is really good when you have your Reclamation in play, because then, because, you know, you just get so much mana with Wilderness Reclamation that, like, the fact that it costs four is basically trivial. I mean, Wilderness Reclamation is essentially, um, it's essentially Omniscience, if you're really, you know, it's, it's basically four mana Omniscience. You just get to play every card in your hand. And so then at that point, you know, Ral's Outburst is good. The problem is, would you want this card in Teamer Reclamation over all of the other good cards that Teamer Reclamation already gets to play? You know, how you're only putting 60 cards in your deck. Does Ral out, Ral's Outburst actually push anything else out of the deck? Um, and that's 
that's where I'm not sure. Chemistry's Insight, it does play really well with it, whether you bin your own Chemistry's Insight or just how, how I said, like you can either cast Chemistry's or this. Um, uh, yeah, we'll talk about Tulsimer in, in a little bit. <clears throat> so I'm going to go with just a limited grade. I, I, I don't think this quite makes it. Um, but it has some potential to be a role filler in that, in that kind of deck, like a team or reclamation deck. Uh, there's a lot of good cards to play though. And I, I don't think this will, this won't quite make it. Somebody asked, are we sure the combo of expansion into expansion works? And yes, that, that combo does like that we talked about earlier if any spell on the stack whether you cast it or your opponent cast it um and then you expansion that spell and then you play another expansion to copy the expansion the first expansion then you can just continually co copy expansion over and over and over again and kill your opponent so yeah opt plus the two expansions or shock plus the two expansions you just have this card in play and your opponent casts a chemistry's inside at end step, they tap out for that, then you just double expansion, you know, cast your expansion, cast your other expansion, you win, kind of thing. You just need you need any spell any spell that costs four or less on the stack that expansion can copy. You know, obviously instant or sorcery spell. It can't copy creatures. Um, and then uh, you get to combo off. If you have two, two of them. Yeah, it's kind of broken. <laughs> What your life total is nine thousand two hundred and thirty-two. That's a lot of life. <laughs> Sorry, Master sh shared a screenshot in chat with on Arena having the life total nine thousand two hundred and thirty-two. That's pretty silly. Hey, what's up, Johnny Popeye? All right, continuing on, Roalesk. Apex Hybrid, two green, green, blue, four, five, flying trample. When Rolesque Hy Apex Hybrid enters the battlefield, put two one, one counters on another target creature you control. And when Rolesque dies, proliferate, then proliferate again. Whew, there's a lot going on with this card. So at the baseline, we have four, like, if the battlefield's clear, when you play Roalesque, which will happen quite often, like that just happens in standard quite a bit. Whenever you're playing your five mana creature, you don't always have other creatures. So saying that that the battlefield's clear, you're you're paying for a four mana four or five tramp flying trample, which is not spectacular. However, if there is just any other creature that you have on the battlefield, um, then you you do get to put two counters on that creature, and so that's that's a pretty good buff, especially if you know it could be just a mana creature. That you know you have to put your counters on a mana creature, which you don't really want to do, unless it's Incubation Druid. It could be um, a creature you get to attack with, though. Like maybe you have whatever other creature um, in play, a Nullhide Ferox or whatever that you have in play, um, a Jade Light Ranger that you get to put a couple counters on it, and then you know get to smash in with a bigger creature. That's pretty nice. Um, and then the. The dies part proliferate, then proliferate again. That can either do nothing, or it can do everything. <laughs> you know, there's so much, there's so much variance in like how powerful this card is, kind of thing. Um, somebody says it's a, a fantastic Vanifar target, and absolutely, uh, there'll be times where this is a great card to go, go like this is a, a great one of in a Vanifar deck, um, and a Neoform deck for you to go find. Um, to put into play or also sacrifice a way to proliferate a couple of t a couple of times. Um, it does work very well with Hadana's Climb. Yes, Hadana's Climb putting some counters on stuff does does help there as well. Um, but even if you don't, yeah, even if you don't have the way to sacrifice Roalesque, and you don't have like a good way to make it die, and so you don't have a good way to have the proliferate then proliferate when you want. It's still a pretty nice body. 
Like four or five. I definitely love that it has that fifth toughness. At four or four, I'd be a lot less excited about the card. Definitely love the fifth toughness. Um, Sultai could put this in their deck with the explore creatures, and and uh, I guess you can have your own Vivian minus to kill this to then put two counters on the Vivian. Okay, that doesn't sound great. Um, no, the lands are at the bottom. Lands are last. It's just, there's so much, again, five mana cards, there's so much competition, and I don't really see this being like a, a four of kind of thing. You, you need some kind of like, you know, deck where you love having all the proliferate stuff, where like maybe you already have one in play and you cast another just to kill one so you can proliferate a couple of times. Um, so you've been playing this with Rekindling Phoenix. Yeah, so I know, yeah, Matthew, so you're excited about like a, a teamer deck with like Rekindling Phoenix and playing this with Kiora. So you draw a card whenever it enters because of Kiora's part and then um, and everything like this with in a in a Kiora kind of deck. Um, maybe something there. I don't know. Like there's, there's a lot of places where you can kind of have this card and it, it can definitely do things. Um, as far as so like rating goes though I don't I don't expect it to be like you know like a four of in anything I, I don't know if it's like really like a a highly played deck kind of thing so as far as our rating goes I basically we're, we're basically down we're at like C a powerful card that can see some play in some fringe decks um, I think that's where we're at with Rolesk like a C but I could see like I could see it with like a Kiora deck. Um, if, if you want to play a Kiora deck, like, yep, that, that, that works really well there. Um, yeah, the Simic Ascendancy, again, <laughs> is, is a thing with all these proliferate cards. Uh, if, if that Simic Ascendancy is a deck, um, I think that this card's, a, I, I don't think, I don't think this is, how is it? Yeah, I don't think this is nearly as good as Sarah for the Scales or Rekindling Phoenix. The biggest problem with Roalesk compared to like other four and five mana cards, like Mythics and Standard, basically, the biggest problem is that when this card is on its own, it is very underwhelming. Four, five for five, just when you compare it to all the other Mythics and Standard, this is just smaller and just underwhelming. So basically you need um, a lot of other things in play or you know, you need another creature for that enter the battlefield to put some counters on that other creature. You need counters on other creatures or planeswalkers in play whenever this dies for like the proliferate to do stuff. So it has good, I mean, when you do have that stuff though, it has a lot of synergy and it can be very powerful. But when you're playing against like a, an uh, Esper control deck, for example, and they, you know, kill a couple of your things. They counter some stuff, and then you, you know, you just play Roalesque on an empty board. They're just like, okay, you can have your four or five for now, and then, then they like untap and play their Teferi and tuck it, and then, you know, it's like, where are you at? Like, what, what did your card do? You know, at least like a Biogenic Goose gets you like another creature, another body, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, in like a Bant, in our like Bant Legends deck, yeah, we're gonna play one in the Bant Legends deck because you know you can do a whole lot of stuff with this. With like Vanifar Neoform, it seems like a great one of uh, to be able to go find. If you're playing a deck built around Kiora, you know it can it can do some stuff there. It it's does a lot with other things, but on its own, um, with all the removal in standard, all the interaction that's in standard on its own, it's not going to. Uh, be good enough. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, four drops are really where you need stuff with Bant Vanifar, not five drops. That is true. There's already good... We already do have a lot of good five drops. It's the four mana slot that is that is kind of lacking. And so that is, that is also a strike. If this cost four and did a little less, and, um, you know, then it could it could be a lot better also. Hey, Chaos. Um, new Ajani, I gave a B plus to New Ajani. 
All right, roll reversal, blue, blue, red, exchange control of two target permanents that share a permanent type. I, I'm calling this a D. I think this is just a classic D of janky build-around card. You know, like Smothering Tithe, Mirror March, or D's, the like janky build-around card. This is, this is exactly that. Um, you want to build a roll reversal deck, you certainly can. Um, and you can, you can have some sweet stories. Like it has a whole lot of potential, you know, you can, you can really romanticize over like what you can do here with a roll, with a roll reversal of like sending your goblin token over and taking their niv mizzet or whatever. Um, I, you know, like uh, there's a lot of things to do with this. Um, but it's just a janky build around card. Saying not bad with a mass. Yeah. You want to build your Grixis a mass deck. Send over an a mass token. You know, with like the two mana thing that keeps making tokens. You know, your 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 new bitter blossom. Y'all know what card I'm talking about. I don't need to scroll up a million times to find it. Go trade that. Um <laughs> Yeah, you can trade you can trade your basic land for their Ascanta the Sunken Ruin. Absolutely. After they flip Ascanta, you can do that. Um and you're gonna get reclamation, so you'd have to so you're gonna play your own enchantments and uh, but yeah, I don't know how you're getting wilderness reclamations too much with this deck. Um but yeah. So janky build around card. Maybe a card you see sometimes in standard, but that's roll reversal. It's a D. Rubber Belt Rioters. One red and a green 0-4 haste. When Rubble Belt Rioters attacks, it gets plus X until end of turn, where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. That will be a limited card. There's a lot of other good creatures you can play at three mana slot in standard. Solar Blaze, two red and a white. Each creature deals damage to itself equal to its power. So obviously a four mana wrath is awesome and standard. That is, you know, and that's an A. You know, we have Kaya's Wrath at an A. Four mana wrath in standard is an A. The problem is, is this is not, this is a conditional wrath. It's not always a wrath. There's a lot of things that won't kill. Um, you know, you can kind of go through the list of things it doesn't kill between, uh, we talked about Feather a little bit ago, Wow Growth Walker, Shalai, Aurelia, um, some other things, though. This is a forever Justice Strike. That's Justice Strike for everything. Um, yeah, so is this like a sideboard card? <clears throat> so you're saying Boros Angels wants this with Aurelia and Feather. Do you want this over uh, Deafening Clarion? Do you want it with Deafening Clarion? Is this like where you're playing Deafening Clarion with this and um, Solar Blaze in those kind of decks? Are you playing Jeskai? Are you playing this in Jeskai Control? Or is like one more mana for Cleansing Nova where you know it definitely kills everything or you can also kill artifacts and enchantments? Or would you rather just have that kind of thing? It is really good. <clears throat> you can make it kind of one-sided whenever you're playing Tajik. So you prevent the damage to your own creatures. Or if you're playing the Wanderer, if you're playing that Planeswalker, the Wanderer prevents all non non-combat damage to like your stuff. So this it would stop Solar Blaze from hitting any of your creatures, kind of thing. Um so <clears throat> I don't know. I kind of feel like this this won't see very much play. And if Solar Blaze, like how it's conditional, it's the kind of card that if for some reason it does see a lot of play, people will just continue to, or they'll just start playing cards that are, like you'll just see an uptick in cards that are good against Solar Blaze um, instead. So... Uh, yeah. 
Somebody here and says this is going to see a lot of play and or be a boogeyman of the format. I'm not really seeing it. I'm, I'm not seeing it. Um, I mean, this plus Lyra can give you a lot of life, but then you just kill your Lyra. And like, if you're if you already have Lyra on the battlefield, you probably already have better creatures than what your opponents have, kind of thing. Um, that is true. It does kill basically everything in red deck wins. And so somebody says red red deck wins and mono white basically have nothing that survives this besides like Snubhorn, at times. But they have nothing that survives Deafening Clarion. And you can just play you can play Deafening Clarion. It's harder for Deafening Clarion to kill like your angels. And everything. So, um, yeah, Wild Growth Walker, not dying to this thing ever. That's kind of a big deal. And uh, if if the uh, like maybe the Feather the Redeemed deck plays this because like maybe it's a sideboard card for the Feather the Redeemed the Boros Heroic deck because the creatures we've talked about for this deck we've talked about Feather, we've talked about Aurelia. We've talked about Dreadhorde Arcanist and Krenko. So Krenko wouldn't die to it. Dreadhorde Arcanist would not die to it. So maybe maybe a sideboard card there and maybe a, a sideboard card in an angel deck. Maybe. So I'm going with like a... I think it's either a D plus or a C minus. I, I think... A fringe sideboard card seems about right, actually. So let's go with a C, like a, a, a fringe sideboard card that maybe sees a little bit of main deck play. But there are a lot of good <clears throat> Wraths in Standard, a lot of good removal in Standard. Uh, not expecting Solar Blaze to do a whole lot. It does kill a lot of stuff, right? But... There are a lot of good options to kill stuff. Also in standard. All right, so I'm going to see with for Solar Blaze. Okay, next up, Soren Vengeful Bloodlord. Two white and a black, four loyalty. As long as it's your turn, creatures and planeswalkers you control have lifelink. Soren Vengeful plus two. Soren Vengeful Bloodlord deals one damage to target player or planeswalker. Minus X, return target creature card with converted mana cost. X from your graveyard to the battlefield. That creature is a vampire in addition to its other types. <clears throat> this card's kind of weird. So I wish the plus two ability was better. I wish it dealt. Sorry, Hawkeye. Okay. Come here. Come here, boy. Ah, there we go. Um, I wish the the plus two ability at least dealt one damage to any target. Um, you know, the fact that it can't help pick off creatures is a little annoying. And yeah, I, w I would rather it be a, a plus one instead of plus two and deal one damage to anything. I think I would, I would rather have plus one deal one damage to anything than plus two and limit it to player or planeswalker. Um, and <clears throat> we the minus X, you know, like let's say you're returning a two drop back. Uh, you can do, you know, it's basically like a Johnny Mentor of Heroes that you can mi minus two, bring back a two drop, minus two again, bring back another two drop kind of thing. But it's a little, this is a little better though, because you, you get to choose. So, you know, minus three to bring back a three drop, minus four, bring back a four drop. Like that, that is better than a Johnny's, a Johnny adversary of Tyna, Tyrant's minus. The, whether that means you, you play this over a Johnny adversary of Tyrant's, probably not. I think a Johnny adversary of Tyrant's has like this card beat pretty good at like the plus minus everything there. The main reason why you would want to play this, this card is the top line. I think the top line is the the biggest thing to play this card. So giving your creatures and planeswalkers lifelink. Um in like a, a Mardu a Mardu Aristocrats deck, I honestly think that's that's really valuable. Um 
Mardu Aristocrats is the kind of deck that really struggles against other aggro decks because it has like a painful mana base and the creatures are kind of small and you don't really have like the time to like kind of sit back and like build your battlefield and sacrifice some different creatures and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, when your opponent's just playing like, you know, Runaway Steamkin, Goblin Chain Whirler, bolt, bolt some creatures, attack you, that kind of stuff. Giving your creatures lifelink is, is awesome in that kind of matchup. Um, now, you know, you do have to have your, your creature survive, of course, but so I could, I could see it being played in like a, a Mardu, uh, Mardu Aristocrats, probably sideboard, um, against, against aggro, um, you know, giving your creatures lifelink, like that's, that's pretty big. And I feel like, I think we talked, um, oh yeah. The other thing it does, um, I, I knew it did something else that I, I couldn't remember what, but we talked about this last time, is this this also does pair really, really well with Gideon Blackblade. Uh, we talked about this when we talked about the white cards. Um, Gideon Blackblade being three loyalty, being a 4-4, four, four, and then you, you drop your Sauron on turn four, give your Gideon lifelink. Like, that's really nice. Um, so that, that pairs really well, giving Gideon lifelink. Um... And then, yeah, you, you can bring back your Sarah for the scales or, you know, your two drop, your three drop. You know, it does just like trade for Sarah. You know, it does, you have to minus four to bring back Sarah for the scales, but there's going to be times you'll want to do that. Um, tick up like six loyalty for four mana is a lot of loyalty that then you can minus and bring back other things. Um, I think that's the most common play pattern will probably be play it, tick up, and then wait till the next turn, minus, bring something back, unless you're bringing something back like a two or a three drop right away. Um, so, yeah, um, yeah, bring back Resplendent Angel, have it survive, bring, bring back Midnight Reaper, um, draw it, like, this works really well with Midnight Reaper, because, you know, like, you're gonna want the extra life with Midnight Reaper, where Midnight Reaper gives you the extra cards, um, so it works, it works great there, uh, you know, get back your Judith to help protect, or your Priest of Forgotten Gods kind of thing, so yeah, I'm looking at this as, like, Mardu, Mardu Aristocrats, um, maybe, maybe a black, white Oketra Bantu deck, uh, that's going a little bit bigger. Maybe that kind of deck also not a hundred percent sure. Um, yeah, does, yeah. Cause Midnight Reaper says it deals one damage to you. Is that, is that exactly Midnight Reapers? Yeah. Midnight Reaper does the damage. So yeah, you just don't take any damage from Midnight Reaper. You just, you just draw cards. So yeah, it works works great with Midnight Reaper. So I think this is kind of like a, a role player in some fringe strategies kind of thing. Um, so probably about around like a C for the rating scale. But this is, you know, this is going to be a standard card. We're going to play this card some, you know, like especially like Mardu Aristocrats and other like black, white mid-range decks. We'll see some Soren. Soren's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and remember, it is only your turn that your creatures are getting lifelink. It would definitely be better if they always had lifelink. You know, if you could be blocking with lifelink, that would be a whole lot better. Um, all right, Soul Diviner. Blue and a black, 2-3. Um... Yeah, somebody says it's much easier to sell Soren whenever a Johnny leaves the format. Soren's going to be better against aggro, where a Johnny's going to be better against control, kind of thing. Um, all right, random question here: When is it worth it to go for the one-one counter on Riot creatures versus Haste? Usually, whenever the game's going to be going longer, the longer the game goes, the more important the one-one counter is. You know, if the game's going to take another like four turns. You probably want the one one counter so you can attack for for more over those those turns kind of thing, um, and also when it, there's going to be other when you're the more creatures your opponent plays the more the one one counter the more importance the one one counter is. Also, like basically the longer you think your creature is going to survive, if you think your creature is going to die, the next turn you pro you probably want the haste. <clears throat> All right, soul diviner. Uh, blue and a black, 2-3, tap, remove a counter from an artifact creature, land, or planeswalker you control, draw a card. Is this really going to be a thing? 
Are like are we are we building a, a blue black zombie deck that has counters on stuff that we want to play a two three that all it does is like we have to like untap with our two three and then we tap it and we remove a counter from like our amass thing and then draw a card. Is that like worth playing a, that card in standard instead of just playing you know anything else? Because, like, are we are we actually fitting that into our amass deck? That is very slow, and it doesn't like at that point. Like when you're tapping it to to do this, you're not doing anything in combat unless you. I guess you you know you could wait till your opponent's end step. But I guess that's what you're really doing. You're not doing it during your turn. You're wait. You know you're sitting back trying to block with your two three and then end step tap remove something draw a card. I don't know. I'm yeah Mike says I'm still confused why this isn't Simic I'm kind of confused why this isn't Simic also um yeah there's just a lot better things we could be doing right so I'm gonna go with an F for Soul Diviner it it can eat yeah I mean it's I know it's it's haphazard but Bardman hate like why why do why do people need to hate on my haphazard but Bardman I'm trying to play a haphazard but Bardman and they just I just remove my counters. Um, you you do get to make your blast zone a token. Yes, you can you can destroy a bunch of tokens with blast zone after you use this. But are you are you really putting soul diviner in your deck just to remove a counter from a blast zone so you can kill tokens? Like that. Not so sure about that. It does work really well with persist, I guess. Yeah, in in other formats, you want to remove your counter from your kitchen finks. That's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, over nine turns, you can draw nine cards with the Vitu Gazi land. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, I know it removes the counter from like these other permanents. Like, yeah, treasure map. You could you get to scry one with your treasure map, re remove your counter from your treasure map. It just doesn't feel like you're just playing like it's that's so much work that you're putting into to like draw a card that like while you are sitting there scrying with your treasure map and then activating your soul diviner to remove your counter from your treasure map and draw a card like what is your opponent doing is your opponent just not doing anything like this is just a two three no proliferate is a choose with proliferate you you choose what things there you go see right here proliferate choose any number of permanents and or players then give it another counter to each of those so that's a choose um all right uh so i'm, I'm going with an f for soul diviner still store of dev dev karin dev karin all right, store of Devkaran Lich. One BBG, five four trample. Whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker, return it to your hand. Target creature or planeswalker card in your graveyard that wasn't put there this combat. This is going to be another F for me. <laughs> yeah, this card is yeah, it's Soul Diviner's F for respect for Domri. Um. Store of, uh, so we're, we're talking about, so we got four mana, five, four trampler that every time it hits the opponent, we get to raise dead a creature or planeswalker. The thing is, is that that's asking a lot. So like if, if you don't actually get to connect with your opponent, it's not doing anything. I would rather have, um, we have, what's the other, oh man, I'm blanking on the name of it now. Golgari Find Broker. There you go. Nailed it. So Golgari Find Broker costs four mana. It's a three, four. It doesn't have trample. Three, four is certainly worse than five, four trample. But whenever it just enters the battlefield, you immediately can return any permanent, not just creature or planeswalker, any permanent you want. Put that back in your hand. It's most likely a creature or planeswalker, but just saying. And you just get that effect immediately. It's also not legendary. Um, I, I'm just playing Golgari Find Broker. I'm just not playing Store of kind of thing so yeah 
Yeah, and that's yeah. Once you start hitting your opponent with the five four trample, you hit once, then you get your fine broker. If you hit again, you get another one. But by that by that point, if you've hit twice with a five four trampler, you're probably doing okay. Probably doing okay. Yeah, it does not go back to the battlefield. No, it goes goes back to your it goes to your hand. So, all right, Tamio Collector of Tales. Two green and a blue for five loyalty planeswalker. Spells and abilities your opponents control can't cause you to discard cards or sacrifice permanents. Plus one, choose a non-land card name, then reveal the top four cards of your library. Put all cards with the chosen name from among them into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. Minus three, return target card from your graveyard to your hand. Dirk says, I'm so excited about Tamio. Huh. And... Man, a lot of y'all are really excited about this card. All right, so it's four mana for you tick up and you maybe draw a card, right? Um, I think that I think you're gonna draw a card. I mean, I, I don't know how often. You know, I'm just kind of just ballparking here. Like I haven't done any kind of math or anything, but I think you're you're drawing a card like not a very high percentage of the time. You know, like uh, you know, twenty five percent of the time or something like that. Like. I can't imagine that you're you're normally naming one of the top four cards of your library that's a non-land. Like that's gotta not happen very often. So for the most part, you're like milling, you're milling the top four cards of your library and sometimes drawing one. Um, it is of course it does obviously work better whenever you're scrying and things like that. And you and if, if there's any way for you to know the top card of your library. Um, but for the most part, you're milling a bunch and sometimes drawing a card. Um, yeah, you, you can get your god back with this, of course. The minus three, just return a card from your graveyard to your hands. So you're like minus three to, uh, what's the old card that does that? Um, it's not revitalize, but, um, yeah, you're, you're, you're finding regrowth. There you go. So you're minus three to regrowth. That's not like four mana to regrowth and have this planeswalker stick around is not really that exciting either. She mills over your graveyard really fast. So yeah, like maybe this with new Jace self mill, like that is that is does mill over really fast. So if if you want to make a, a self mill deck with this and new Jace and just hope your new Jace doesn't die and that it's alive whenever you draw your last card, you can do that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, you minus three to go Gari Fine Broke. So you you basically Instead of having the three four body for a Golgari Fine Broker, you have this Tamio in play, um, kind of thing. The biggest thing, the the most, so neither I don't know. I'm not really that excited about the plus one or the minus three, honestly, with this card. The thing that I think that is is kind of exciting about it is honestly the the first ability. Just having spells and abilities your opponents control cannot cause you to discard or discard cards or sacrifice permanents. I actually think that, that that could be more important in this format than than like what y'all think. Do you know a card wants you to discard cards or sacrifice permanents? Nickel Bolas. This should be a really highly played card. So like instead of the plus one doing that very devastating exile card from your hand or a permanent. Oh it No, it doesn't stop it, does it? No! Oh, no, Nicol Bolas is exile. Oh, so you still can. Never mind. Oh, never mind. All right, Tamio F. <laughs> oh, no. Never mind. It exiles. Uh, Nicol Bolas, so good. <laughs> All right, never mind. So Tamio is going to be a D for a... I know you're not happy about that grade, Hawkeye, but yeah, no, Tamiya's a D for a janky build-around card. If you want to build your janky self-mill deck with your Tamiya and your Jace, I guess you can do that, but <laughs> never mind. Uh, I was all excited about Tamiya stopping Nicol Bolas, but it doesn't. Bolas wins again. All right, we have Teferi Time Raveler. Is that how you spell Raveler? I guess it is. Kind of looks weird, though. Teferi Time Raveler. One white, blue. Four loyalty. Uh, 
first ability, each opponent can cast spells only any time they could cast a sorcery. Plus one until your your next turn. You may cast sorcery spells as though they had flash. Minus three, return up to one target artifact, creature, or enchantment. To its owner's hand, draw a card. So there's probably a reason why this is one of the most expensive cards in the set. This card's pretty awesome. It has two incredibly good abilities. The first one... I don't know if the last one's incredibly good, but the first one is just amazing. Making each opponent cast their spells only any time they could cast a sorcery. That is awesome against control decks, of course. Um, okay, Raveler is not a real word. Okay. Um, so that's... That is awesome. Obviously, that's great against control. Obviously, that is great against Wilderness Reclamation. And if you have an ability that's great against Wilderness Reclamation, you're okay in my books. Um, so you get to... Um, yeah, so shutting down Wilderness Reclamation and making like the extra mana that they generate not matter at all. Um, that's that's okay in, in my books raveler is a real word okay um all right so what are the other two abilities what are we doing here so plus one until your next turn you may cast sorcery spells as though they had flash that's obviously going to be good if you have a sorcery spell that you want to have to have flash most of the time though when you're playing a blue white deck you're probably playing a lot of instant speed spells you know um i think the biggest thing we've seen or we've kind of thought about with this is playing Teferi in like a Bant colored where there's like some green sorceries. Um, that'd be nice to be able to play those instant speed. Also, if you want to play it Jeskai style and have your um, your Banefire instant speed, you can. But for the most part, I'm not expecting the, the tick up to do a ton. You know, it, it will do something at some points. Um, of course, you know, with your own... Uh, wilderness Reclamation in a band tech. I guess you, you get to play whatever sorcery, but if you're playing a Wilderness Reclamation deck, you're probably just not even playing sorcery, so it's probably just not going to do anything there. Um, but yeah, like you can flash like uh, Time Wipe, yes. Kaya's Wrath, yes. Those are like those are probably the main things you're going to be flashing in are your sweepers, like the Time Wipe that's over here on the side, or your Kaya's Wrath if you're playing this in Esper. Um, but for the most part, that's going to be like, that will, that will happen at times and that'll be cool. Um, for the most part, you're just like plus one, put a loyalty counter. You know, you're basically just like, take your turn, put a loyalty counter on your Teferi. I think that's going to happen most of the time. Um, natural percent has, has a good one too for Esper, uh, that I thought about before, but I forgot about for right now. I wasn't going to mention, but thank you. Um, yes, for Esper control. Also plays Thought Erasure, and having Thought Erasure on draw step is awesome. Like, you know, going draw step, let me take a look at your hand um, with Thought Erasure after you draw. Um, that is that is awesome. Anytime you have instant speed discard that you can do discard during the draw step, that is a very valuable thing to have. Um, all right, so, you know, the plus one not doing a whole lot, but the minus three is really good. You know, bouncing a... Cr any artifact, creature, or enchantment, and drawing a card, that's really good. You know, like, three mana, bounce your thing, draw a card, have your Teferi stick around. Now you can only play spells, sorcery speed, and then we start slowly ticking up. That's pretty good. Against aggro decks, you're not going to really want Teferi too much. I mean, it, it does slow them down, draw a card kind of kind of thing. It does do that. Um, but, like, the first two things aren't really doing too much against an aggro deck. Um but against Control and against Wilderness Reclamation, it's awesome. So for the most part, I kind of feel like Teferi is more of a sideboard card than a main deck card. Um, the minus three can work on your own stuff too. So you can you can bounce your Kaya, your Oath of Kaya in your in your Esper deck if you want. You know you have your Oath of Kaya, bounce your Oath of Kaya, draw a card, replay your Oath of Kaya, kind of thing. There, are, you know, there are certainly neat little tricks you can do. You know, so maybe Teferi's like a one of maybe two of in the main deck have some more in the sideboard I feel like it's certainly a sideboard kind of thing um and uh but yeah for the most <clears throat> somebody said earlier they liked kaya instead um that they're saying kaya or not kaya what was it narset narset instead as like the blue planeswalker against other um 
control decks. And I, I really like Narset. I think Narset is awesome. We gave Narset an A minus earlier. Um, Teferi, real similar there. I'm, I'm kind of feeling that A minus rating also. I think that they are, you know, basically just as good cards kind of thing. But this certainly looks like a great sideboard card against control and against um, Wilderness Reclamation. But then also a card that we'll see a little bit of main deck play in various spots also. Just simply three mana Planeswalker, bounce something, draw a card. There's not very much downside with that, even if that's about all it's doing in some matchups. So to Fairy Time Raveler, going to go ahead and... We go ahead and give an A minus. All right, we have Tenth District Legionnaire up next. Red and a white, two two haste. Whenever you cast a spell that targets Tenth District Legionnaire, put a one one counter on it and then scry one. This card is awesome. This is what is going to make the Boros heroic deck a thing. That you know, I've I've been giving a B. To the other cards with um, the Boros, um, the Boros Heroic deck, like other staples in that deck, because I do think that's a very real deck, and that's basically the only place where this card goes. I don't think we're really putting this in Boros Aggro too much, like Boros, like Mardu Humans with like Hero of Precinct One. Are we playing Tenth District Legionnaire? Probably not, because we're probably like not playing that many spells that target our own thing. So it's you know mostly going to be a two-two haste. I mean, maybe if you want to play a bunch of integrities, also kind of thing. Um, but yeah, the the feather um, it does help flip Path of Metal. That's true. If you have a Path of Metal deck, this card's good in a Path of Metal deck. That's true. Yeah, so B for Boros. <laughs> so yeah, B is where I was going with this this card. But this, this is solid. Like, this would be a good card if it didn't have haste. It would still be good. This would probably be pretty good if it didn't even have the scry one. If it just had that, if it was 2-2 two, two haste and then put a 1-1 one, one counter on it whenever you target it, I think that would be pretty good too, even if it didn't have the scry one. It's like, both of those are just kind of like, you know, extra, you know, and that's what makes a card uh, go from being not quite good enough for standard to something that you see uh, quite a bit in standard. As we talked about, like a, we have like Gatebreaker Ram. I think this is kind of similar to Gatebreaker Ram, honestly. Where Gatebreaker Ram, you know, also just had Trample and also had Vigilance. And, you know, like if it had, if it didn't have one of those, it would probably still be good enough. Like, let's say it didn't have Vigilance. Gatebreaker Ram would still be pretty good. But the fact that it has Vigilance, you're like, man, this one's good. This is the same kind of thing with 10th District Legionnaire. If it didn't have Haste, it would still be like, yeah, that's... I mean, that thing attacks for a whole lot whenever you, like, untap, place some mana, like, you know, start, or uh, pay some mana, start targeting it, get a bunch of counters on it, you get to scry, that's pretty good. But then you have haste also, and you're like, ugh, you can just, like, on turn seven, die out of nowhere. Um, you know, like, your your opponent just is sitting with some pump spells, they top deck the 10th District Legionnaire, play it, um, play a couple pump spells, put some counters on it, swing in for a bunch. And, you know... It has the scry also. It's it's just a really solid card. Um, yeah. So there we go. I'm going with the B for Tent District Legionnaire. I think that the Boros Heroic deck, I think that'll be a real deck. Um, I could, of course, be wrong because obviously that's a new deck that we haven't seen it really tested against the metagame and we haven't seen people really try to build decks against it or anything like that. We just haven't even seen it at all yet but i feel like there's a lot of cards for it in this set and just kind of kind of like how there was gates in the previous set in ravnica allegiance how there's a lot of cards for gates when there's gates ablaze and gate breaker ram and gate colossus and you know we're looking at that when we were doing the set review last time with the gates um i was calling those like you know a janky deck you know i was like oh if you want to build this janky gates deck you have like some stuff for it but there was a lot for it, and it turned into a real deck. And I kind of feel the same way with the Feather the Redeemed 10th District Legionnaire deck. There seems to be a lot of stuff for this. So I, I'm calling it a real deck. For, um, I could be wrong there. All right, next we got Time Wipe. Two white, white, blue, sorcery. Return a creature you control to its owner's hand, then destroy all 
creatures. I feel like for now, Cleansing Nova is going to be a a better card than Time Wipe in blue-white decks that don't have access to Kaya's Wrath. Obviously, Kaya's Wrath is, is really where you're wanting to be in Esper. But if you're playing some blue-white deck that's not Esper, that doesn't have Kaya's Wrath, <clears throat> I think I like Cleansing Nova these days. Instead of Time Wipe, because Cleansing Nova being able to destroy artifacts and enchantments is pretty valuable also. Um... <clears throat> Oh, do you have to have a creature on the battlefield to even cast this? Return a creature? Yeah, it's not up to one creature, is it? So you can't even cast this unless you have a creature on the battlefield? Whew. Man, this is even worse. I, I already didn't think very highly of this card, and now I think this is pretty bad. <laughs> Ugh. So, yeah, I guess... So you're going to have to... So we're gonna have to play this in a creature deck. So we're thinking like Augur like Augurabolus. You know, can go find the time wipe. You can pick your Augurabolus back up. Oh, gosh, yeah, we're just we're just not playing this. Um, it doesn't target, but you just have to have a creature just even to cast it, right? Okay, so it doesn't it doesn't require a creature. Okay, so now y'all are telling me it doesn't require. Okay, good. Okay, that's good. Okay. Because it doesn't say target, so you don't actually have to have the creature. Okay. Whew. All right, we're back into this being modestly playable now, again. <laughs> oh, man, if you had to have a creature, it's just like, well, this is never going to see the light of day. <laughs> All right, so you can still have your five mana Wrath. Um, until, until rotation, I'm still playing Cleansing Nova in any kind of deck that can have this because of the versatility of destroying artifacts and enchantments. And sure, you don't get to save your one creature at times, but that's that added versatility and also easier to cast uh, just going with Kaya's Wrath. Or sorry, just going with Cleansing Nova until rotation. Maybe after rotation um, with when Cleansing Nova's gone, and if you don't want to play Kaya's Wrath for some reason, then, you know, Time Wipe could be something here. But, but yeah, if you do have a creature, you do have to return it if you don't, you know. But I guess that's probably better than having it die. Um, I, yeah, so I'm going with, I mean, I guess for now it's just an F, maybe a little better after rotation, but I don't, I mean, I guess, I guess like a, I guess a D, I guess it's a D. It's a, it's a card that you'll sometimes see play in standard, but underpowered compared to other sweepers and everything. So yeah, this, this is just a D, like a card you'll sometimes see people play. Yes, with Deputy of Detention, you if your Deputy of Detention exiled a creature, you can return your Deputy of Detention and then kill the creatures that that re-entered, and then you have your Deputy of Detention still. Um, and yeah, you want to play it in like your Frilled Mystic deck? I guess. I'm still going D. That still all seems pretty janky. Um... <laughs> Chucky says any card with the word time in it in the name is a good card that's my rule it's pretty good so I'll go D with time wipe alright Tulsimer friend of wolves 2 GG 2 green green white for a 3-3 three, three. whenever Tulsimer friend with wolves enters the battlefield create Voja friend of elves friend to elves a legendary 3-3 three, three, green and white wolf creature token Whenever a wolf enters the battlefield under your control, you gain three life, and that creature fights up to one target creature you don't control. Is there enough... There's not, like, a, enough wolves in standard for, like, a standard wolf deck, right? That can't be it. That can't be a thing. All right, so somebody here says it's it's super against red deck wins. And I'm not so sure about that. I, I Not so sure about that. So one thing that you have to you have to realize is it does say like the second part is like the second part, whenever a wolf enters the battlefield, then you gain three life and that creature fights another creature. You only get those things if Tulsimer is still alive. So whenever, whenever you play this Tulsimer, 
if you're playing against a red deck, it's a 3-3. Three, three. So your opponent has Lightning Strike. You play this. They Lightning Strike your Tulsimer in response to the trigger to create Voja. Then whenever Voja enters the battlefield, your Tulsimer is already dead, so you're not going to gain three life, and you don't get to fight anything. So like, there's plenty of times where I've played Biogenic Ooze, and my opponents killed the Biogenic Ooze in response to the, the Ooze token before the Ooze comes out kind of thing. Um, so you don't gain... So you, you wouldn't gain... I mean, you would gain three life if you think about them not lightning striking you, I guess, if you think of that. Um, and you still have a 3-3 three, three at their lightning strike, yes. But we're talking about a five-mana card here. You know, like five-mana card... There's a lot of really good things you can do for five-mana. And if it's supposed to be great against mono-red, we're still talking that it may not be perfect kind of thing. Um... But yeah, I, I do think it's it's pretty comparable to Biogenic Ooze here. Um, at end step with Biogenic Ooze, you get you would have two three threes at if you survive at end step. This you'd have two three threes. This one you would gain three life, and your other three three can fight another creature if you would choose. With Biogenic Ooze, you can continue to make more tokens, and also the, your tokens gain get bigger. Um, the exact turn you play this, Tulsimer is going to do more for you than Biogenic Ooze. Every um, turn after that, Biogenic Ooze is going to continue to be better than Tulsimer kind of thing. Um, if you compare this to Tristani, a lot of people are compared it to, to Tristani. Um, making two, two, two life linkers. And having a 1-4 and buffing all your other creatures plus... Um, giving all your other creatures plus 1, plus 1. It's probably going to be better for you. If you're th talking about just the red matchup, I like Tristani more against red. I like a 1-4 body is better than the 3-3 three, three body. And, you know, if they lightning strike one of your life linkers right away, like, that's, you know, still kind of fine. I think, I think, I think Tristani is better against red than Tulsimer is. I think the, the way for Tulsimer to be better than Tristani or Biogenic Ooze is for the fight to be good. You know, if you are fighting um, Thief of Sanity, like somebody said, um, if you are actually fighting creatures and killing stuff, that is the way for Tulsimer to be better. So Tulsimer has to survive after you play it for, you know, when, you, when the wolf comes down, and then that wolf has to be able to fight something relevant and kill something relevant. That's, that's how Tulsimer can... Uh, be better than Tristani or Biogenic Ooze. Is that going to happen very often? Probably not. Probably not. Um, the other way for this to be better, of course, is if there's a lot more wolves in standard. If you want to play, so if you want to, if you want to build a jank uh, arcane adaptation deck, make a bunch, have all your things be wolves, play a bunch of wolves, get a bunch of wolves to enter the battlefield to gain three life for each one. Obviously, that's good. Um, but yeah, wanting Tulsimer instead of Lyra Dombringer, that's, that's, that's going to be kind of tough. Um, yeah. Uh, so basically, if there's a bunch of wolves in standard for something else, maybe. But for now, I'm calling this just a D. Um, unfortunately... Tristani, Biogenic Ooze, Lyra Dombringer. There's just so many good cards at the five mana slot in standard, and I don't think Tulsimer matches up with them. I think if we're trying to fight a Thief of Sanity, that Thief of Sanity was probably played on turn three and has already hit us a couple of times, and we're already very far behind. <clears throat> All right, Tyrants, Tyrants, Scorn, Blue, and a Black instant choose one destroy target creature with cmc three or less or return target creature to its owner's hand there's a lot of good removal in standard i don't think we're playing this i'm just going to go with an f or sorry with the limited sorry this is just a limited card go and go with the limited rating because it's uncommon and kind of moving on i guess this is kind of been a long video already so <clears throat> just going to go with a limited rating here with tyrant scorn Widespread Brutality. One black, red, red, sorcery, amass two. Then the army you amass deals damage equal to its power to each non-army creature. 
So again, we're talking about like maybe a four mana sweeper. Um, at the very worst, if you have nothing else, it's deals two to everything else. So it's like four mana for a fiery cannonade kind of thing. Sorcery speed. It's not very good. You basically you basically need to play this in an arm in a in a dedicated a mass deck. Oh. Sorry. So you need it. Yeah, you need a dedicated a mass deck for this to um, to be played. So I guess does Tulsimer remind you of Huntmaster? I mean, not really. Huntmaster. Uh, the power with Huntmaster is, you know, like having it on the battlefield for all the time. The power of Huntmaster is not just playing it and getting two two twos and gaining two life. It's the ability to, you know, change the game over time. Tulsimer doesn't do that. So yeah, if you have a dedicated mass deck, maybe, but I'm not I'm not sold on this card in the slightest. I'm going with a D, a janky build around card for a mass for widespread brutality. Uh, not really seeing it in standards, highly played decks. All right, we have Angrath, Captain of Chaos. Uh, two Rakdos Rakdos for a five loyalty Planeswalker saying creatures you control have menace and it has minus two to a mass two. So, you know, obviously the, you can just kind of point right back over to widespread brutality over here. <laughs> so again, if you want your, your janky dedicated to mass deck, here you go. Uh, but this is also a D. Um, we already have a good Angrath and standard, so we're good there. I mean, these, these are uncommon planeswalkers. They're not all going to be great. Ashiok. One Demir Demir for a five loyalty planeswalker. Don't you think Angrath's hammer is really tiny, though? That is a really tiny hammer <laughs> on Angrath over here. It's like, it's like rah, rah, look at this little timer, little, little tiny hammer I have here. Um, all right, Ashiok Dream Render, one Demir Demir, five loyalty. Spells and abilities your opponents control can't cause their controller to search their library. Minus one target player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard, then exile each opponent's graveyard. This card looks to be a lot better for other formats than for standard. Uh, for standard, you don't really have, the opponents aren't going to have nearly as many spells and abilities to search their own library. If for some reason the Neoform Prime Speaker Vanifar deck uh, becomes really big, then Ashiok is a is a great counter to it. Um, it is like so like that top ability isn't going to be doing a ton in standard. You know, like there's Field of Ruin. Um, that's kind of you know like there's not very much. Um, the the really nice thing about Ashiok is this minus one. This could certainly be good against some different different decks. You know, Arclight Phoenix deck exile their graveyard kind of thing. I guess. Um, <laughs> Boot says, I'm going to... Yeah, you want to play Ashiok with Follow the Thran? So yeah, Follow the Thran, destroy the lands, uh, then exile their graveyard. There you go there. Um, this does shut down fetch lands, yes. So like in, in modern, this is great because it shuts down fetch lands and things like that. Um, uh, the minus one would keep the Ascanta from flipping, yes. Um... So if you want to play this against, like, uh, Simic Reclamation so you can exile their Chemister's Insights uh, that they cast so they don't get to flash it back, uh, keep their Escanta from flipping because you're exiling the graveyard kind of thing. Um, yeah, it doesn't stop an already flipped Escanta. It stop a Escanta from flipping. Um, uh, it does get rid of the, the God Eternals, yes, that... Uh, tuck themselves back you can that's like kind of the point of the card i guess to you know that's why it's four cards get rid of the the god eternals put them in the graveyard then exile them kind of thing uh rekindling phoenix exile that after the die um it does not do anything with assassin's trophy uh assassin's trophy is something that you control that causes your opponent to search this is stops things your opponents control that cause them to search so it does not stop that 
Um, so, yeah. If if you want a J self mill, if you want this, yeah, in your janky Jace Tamio self mill deck, you're trying to mill yourself out as fast as possible. This this does a good job at it. Um, but this is Ashdog is basically for older formats. It does. I don't think it's going to do too much in standard. Um, but maybe uh, we're calling it with a D with the janky self janky uh, build around card. You know your self mill deck, your follow the three on deck, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, going with Ashiok being a D. All right, Dove in hand of control, two in Azorius for five loyalty artifact instant and sorcery spells. Your opponents cast cost one more to cast. Minus one until your next turn. Prevent all damage that would be dealt to and dealt by target permanent and opponent controls. This does a pretty good job of locking down. Sorry, locking down one creature. Um, you do have to be able to target it, so it can't be like a hexproof thing. So you can't stop like a, a Carnage Tyrant. But it does. It does a good job. Like minus one, stop this one big thing from attacking me. Like you know, prevent the damage it would deal, kind of thing. Uh, for a few turns, but you, we're talking about standard here. That's not good enough for standard. Um, the tax ability in like control mirrors could be kind of cool, but we've already looked at. Um, we have Narset and Teferi that are both like A minus cards uh, that are three mana planeswalkers for blue decks and blue white decks in like control mirrors. And Dovin's just Dovin's just not as good. Like this is just not like so. This is not. So basically, in a different, like in a different set, like maybe Dovin could see some play, but not in not when we already have better anti control things like three mana planeswalkers in Esper control mirrors. You have Gideon Blackblade, which is awesome. You know Narset, uh, Parter of the Veils, and Teferi Time Bender or whatever Teferi's name is. Um, those are all just going to be better. So, sorry, Dovin. I'm giving you just the limited rating. I don't expect Dovin to see any play. Huali, the Sun's Heart, two and a Selesnia for seven loyalty. Each creature you control assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. You gain life. The minus three ability, you gain life equal to the greatest toughness among creatures you control. Pretty awesome for the very janky defender deck that's where that's the only place this card goes so definitely a d uh, a janky build around card um so you can get um you know you want to you want to play this in the arcades deck and everything there you go like this is just another another one another high alert arcades thing there it doesn't make walls attack. No, that is true. So, um, yeah, it doesn't. It does not make walls attack. So that's worse. Um, yeah. All right, we have Kaya, but I'll also give it a D though. Kaya, Bane of the Dead, two triple Orzov. Or sorry, three triple Orzov, seven loyalty. Um, your opponents and permanents your opponents control with hexproof can be the targets of spells or abilities you control as long as they, as though they didn't have hexproof. Minus three exile target creature. So this is this is, I don't know. Could this actually see play? So it is six mana for a removal spell that like can stick around and you know you get to exile a creature which is the most valuable. Um, instead of just destroy or anything like that. So you get to exile. You can exile again the next turn, and you can target Carnage Tyrant. If, for some reason, Carnage Tyrant got huge, then maybe Kaya. But, I mean, come on. We got Liliana. Hmm. At six mana. All right, never mind. Nope. All right, go unlimited. <laughs> Try to think of how we could play it. Six mana is so much. Nah. Yeah, so there's just better cards. All right, that's a limited card. All right, Kiora, Behemoth, Beckoner. We've talked about this card some. It's two and a Simic for seven loyalty. Whenever a creature with power four or greater enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card and minus one untapped target permanent. I think this could see some play. This 
in you know a janky build around kind of deck. So I'm going to go with a D uh, rating here for Kiora. We have the enchantment already. That's whenever a creature with power four or greater enters, you draw a card. Actually, I don't even know if that's in standard anymore. There is an enchantment that said that at some point. I think that was actually in Konzatark here now that I think about it. There's one where at the beginning of your... Up, there's one in standard that's at the beginning of your upkeep. If you have a power four or greater creature, you draw a card. There's Yeah, so there's that one in standard that's at upkeep, not just ETB. Um, so yeah, you can have this with your Sarkins and Ceiling and a bunch of teamer creatures with power four or greater... That sounds like a janky build around deck <laughs> for me. Um, so it can untap some permanents um, that you know can certainly be useful at different times. You're trying to add a lot of mana, kind of thing. Um, but <clears throat> Kiora and Simic Nexus to untap Ascanta? No, no, because it doesn't doesn't do anything else but just untap and Ascanta, and that's just not worth a card. You'd rather just have some other card. Um, yeah, it is seven untaps and you can get some stuff. Still just calling it a D. Nahiri Storm of Stone, two Boros Boros, six loyalty. As long as it's your turn, creatures you control have first strike and equip abilities you activate cost one less to activate. Minus X Nahiri Storm of Stone deals X damage to target tapped creature. Limited. There's just not very many good. There's just not like good equipment in standard. Uh, they would even make that one cost less to even be worth it. The first strike's kind of cool. Dealing damage to a tapped creature, I guess. Yeah, limited. Better planeswalkers in standard. Yeah, I wanted Nahiri to be better too. <clears throat> Sahili Sublime Artificer. One, is it, is it, five loyalty. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one colorless servo artifact creature token. Yes, that is any non-creature spell whatsoever, not just instant or sorcery. Any non-creature spell, you get a 1-1 one, one artifact. Minus two, target artifact you control becomes a copy of another target artifact or creature you control until end of turn, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. Sahili is good. This is good. Um, played in Delver Legacy? I don't know. I don't know there. Three mana is a lot there. Um, I mean, it's good against... Yeah, it's better than Young Pyromancer against Miracles, but is it better against, like, like Delver Mirrors? Like, no, because the two mana is a lot better than three mana. I, I don't know about that. But... Um, <clears throat> Sahili is awesome. So the the places to use Sahili, there's kind of like two places, basically. I think you're playing this, you can play this in Drake's. Uh, I like this more than Murmuring Mystic. It, it just takes like the Murmuring Mystic slot there because Murmuring Mystic, um, costing four mana was kind of rough. Like when you also have like the Crackling Drakes that cost four mana or like cast, you know, hard casting your Arc White Phoenix kind of thing. I think three mana fits the curve a lot better. Also, if they do have a sweeper, um, you know, like Murray Mystic, you know, dying to the Kaya's Wrath was annoying, where Sahili can stick around um, and continue to make other servos. Also, the, playing it with Drakes is where Sahili's minus two ability can really shine. You can have, you can turn one of your servos into a Crackling Drake for a turn. And that is, you know, that's pretty powerful there. Um, so that's, that's really nice there. So I like Sahili there in that kind of deck. And that's that's likely sideboard, like maybe not main deck. Um, yeah, you, you don't get to... Uh, you do not get flying on your tokens uh, like you did with Murmuring Mystic. But um, Murmuring Mystic was only instant and sorcery, right? I think. I could be wrong. Um, but you do get to turn a token into a Crackling Drake. And that is awesome. And your, your token maker does costs one less and doesn't die to a wrath the other place where we can play some Sahili is maybe if we're going to make an artifact deck uh you know maybe playing tezzeret that needs a whole lot of artifacts out you know karn uh if we can if there's going to be some kind of artifact matters deck with a lot of different artifact matters cards in standard between like uh the car both karns both tezzerets uh that kind of thing 
Sahili works pretty well there. You know, you cast your your artifact, you make another one one kind of thing. And then you can also have one artifact copy another artifact kind of thing. Um, so right, you can't you can't have two you can't have two legendaries on the battlefield at the same time. Correct. So if you if you turn an artifact into a Niv Mizzet, uh, then one of the Niv Mizzets you would have to sacrifice because you can't have two of them. Um, yeah, this this helps in Super Friends for some defense for Planeswalkers. Yeah, it's similar to Dovin to three mana Dovin if you're just doing that if you're just playing like the one spell a turn kind of thing. Um, um, I like I like how they printed this artifact for the artifact deck. I think this is what the artifact deck is kind of missing is like you know a a two mana artifact that that uh, replace itself, you know, like draw card kind of thing. So I like I like Guild Globe, like that that helps out in an artifact deck. That that's a pretty janky deck. So we're talking about like a probably a, a sideboard card in a popular deck plus a key piece in a janky deck kind of thing. I think that's where we're at with Sahili. Um, so as far as grade goes, um, you know, not quite a B, not maybe a little better than a C. So like probably like a, a B minus, like a, a common sideboard card. Um, but, you know, like only a common sideboard card for one archetype though. Uh, but then also a powerful card that could see play in fringe decks. So I'm thinking like a B minus for Sahili. Um, yeah, this, this is a, it's a good card. That's a good card. As far as uncommon Planeswalkers goes, that's probably the best of them for standard. All right, we have Samet, Tyrant Smasher, two Gruel Gruel, five loyalty, creatures you control of haste, minus one, target creature gets plus two, plus one, and gains haste until end of turn, scry one. Uh, now, that's just a limited card. We have a lot of other good good stuff for like the Gruel kind of decks. I think this is worse than, um, like I would rather have the Riot Enchantment, a uh, Rhythm of the Wild here than Samet. Um, yeah. Yeah, these are for constructed, for standard, um, and you can see the grade scale there. These are all the grades for standard, and I've I've already gone through um, all the other colors: white, blue, black, red, and green. You can find all those videos up on YouTube. Put those up yesterday. We did those ones yesterday. All right, uh, Vraska swarms swarms eminence, two Golgari Golgari. Five loyalty. Whenever a creature you control with death touch deals damage to a player or planeswalker, put a 1-1 one, one counter on that creature. Minus two. Create a 1-1 one, one black assassin creature token with death touch. And whenever this creature deals damage to a player or plane. Or sorry, whenever it deals damage to a planeswalker, destroy that planeswalker. Um, hmm. So we get to, all right, so four mana, we get a 1-1 one, one Death Touch creature. With Death Touch creatures are cool, and they can kill a Planeswalker. So, like, the, the Planeswalkers have to actually be, like, if opponents playing Planeswalkers, they actually have to be scared of the Death Touch thing, and they got to use removal on it. Then you can minus two again and get another one, and then if the death touch does deal damage to like the opponent, then you turn it in from a one one to a two two if they don't block it, you know. So they kind of have to like start blocking it or use removal. Like those those tokens are pretty valuable there. Um, so she does just defend herself well. Um, I think maybe a, a D here, you know, like I, maybe Vraska Swarm em Eminence could see a little bit of play, but I mean, comparing this to like Vraska Golgari Queen, I mean, we're gonna want to play Vraska Golgari Queen. For the most part, but yeah, so maybe like a D. Um, it could, it does work with, yeah, with Death Baron with zombies. If Death Baron gives your zombies Death Touch, uh, then you have your creature with Death Touch deal damage to the player. You put some counters on that your zombies. That is true. It's any creature with death touch, just not just these assassin tokens. So again, D. All right, and Tezzeret, Master of the Bridge. Four blue, black. Creature and Planeswalker spells you cast have affinity for artifacts. 
Plus two, Tezzeret, Master of the Bridge, deals X damage to each opponent, where X is the number of artifacts you control. You gain X life. Minus three, return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. And minus eight, exile the top 10 cards of your library. Put all artifact cards from among them onto the battlefield. All right, so we have a lot going on here with this card. Um, <clears throat> so I think the... All right, let's kind of... Let's start from like... We'll kind of start low and go high here. So let's look at the minus three. So if we play Tezzeret, we minus, we're going to return an artifact from our graveyard to our hand. So we're basically uh, doing minus three draw a card. And our card is like the whatever artifact we want to choose from our graveyard. That's not a great ability. That is not a great ability. And yes, this is this is a buy a box. This is the buy a box promo here. Uh, Tezzeret is. Um, so that one's not great. The minus eight, exile the top 10 cards of your library, put all artifact cards from among them onto the battlefield. That's pretty cool. Especially if you're playing a bunch of artifacts that go straight to the battlefield. That's that's pretty nice. So can we get to eight loyalty? So we have, it starts at five, we tick up to two. Um, deal X damage to the, each opponent where X is the number of artifacts you control and gain X life. If we have a good amount of artifacts, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot. Like if we have two artifacts out, whenever we play this, we... Tick up, deal two to them, gain two life. Okay, and then we got a seven loyalty planeswalker. If we're like, you know, trying to stabilize, like the two life is worth something and they want to attack your Tezzeret, that's, you know, attacking a seven loyalty planeswalker. That's a lot you have to attack to kill it. Let's say you have like four artifacts out, you know, deal four, gain four. That starts to kill somebody pretty fast. Um, that can start to ki kill somebody really fast. You know, if you have six artifacts out, deal, you know, anything. So how are we going to get a lot of artifacts in play? Well, we just talked about a way. We have Sahili. I feel like Sahili is perfect with Tezzeret. Or like, if you know, if you want Tezzeret to be good, that plus ability um, where you'd want to have a lot of artifacts. So every spell you you play, you make an artifact. And also you want you want some 1-1s one to be able to chump to be able to help protect Tezzeret. That's really nice. Um or also treasures. Yeah, treasure tokens. Also, if you want to play it, you know, in, in our treasure, like a smothering tithe treasure token kind of deck um another good good way to get a bunch of artifacts also um then the other part is creatures and planeswalker spells you cast have affinity for artifacts that's that's not nothing that's kind of cool like you can you can have your creatures and planeswalkers start costing less by tapping your artifacts start turning your artifacts into mana rocks that's not nothing it's not you know, you have to, you untap with your Tezzeret, you know, it doesn't, you can't cast your Tezzeret with that, right? You can't just tap four um, artifacts and say blue, black, cast your Tezzeret. You need your Tezzeret already on the battlefield for this to work. So you have to have that already out there. But then, you know, you have like both Karns, there's two good four mana uh, colorless Karns that you can just tap four artifacts to cast Karn. Uh, it works really well with Ugin, right? You know, tap some artifacts, cast your Ugin kind of thing. You know, you if you have your Sahili out whenever you're casting these, you make some servos. I feel like there could be a deck here. Um, oh, yeah, you don't tap them. Right. I'm thinking, sorry, sorry. I was thinking like Convoke. No, Affinity just doesn't. Yeah, never mind. You don't tap them. Sorry, my bad, my bad. I was thinking Convoke. So, no, Affinity is just better. Sorry. Right. So, if you, if you have, if you tick up with Tezzeret and you had six artifacts in play because you had like treasures and servo tokens and you somehow had six artifacts in play sorry my bad um then you would get to just cast your ugin immediately and you could cast your karn immediately also because you have four you have six you can just cast these things that's pretty cool and then you can have your karn go grab an artifact creature um like maybe a meteor golem Start casting your Meteor Golem really quickly because then your Meteor Golem is going to cost two less because your Colorless Spells cost two less. And so then it only costs five, and then it has Affinity for five, and you already have five artifacts. So then you can just cast your Meteor Golem. Um, so, yeah. If you'd have six artifacts in play when you play Tezzeret and you have Ugin and Karn in your hand, you just start casting... Play your Ugin, play your Karn, go grab Meteor Golem from your sideboard, cast your Meteor Golem, destroy something. Each each time you play one of these, yeah, you're getting another artifact with your Sahili. Also. 
Um, yeah, I don't know. There could be there could be a deck here. There could certainly be a deck here. Uh, yeah, Meteor Golem, your time to shine has finally come. Meteor Golem's cool. I like me some Meteor Golem. Uh, so, and then after you do this, you just made a bunch more artifacts, so now you get to tick up plus two your Tezzeret and deal a whole lot of damage because you just made a bunch of new artifacts. Um, yeah, so I'm going with a D rating for Tezzeret, of course, because this is some jank that we're brewing up. But this sounds like some a janky build around card. Maybe closer to a C, maybe a fringe card for a maybe a fringe deck, a powerful card for a fringe deck, maybe closer to a C. I uh I could, I could, you can kind of you can kind of get me up to a C. This could be a fringe deck, powerful card for a fringe deck. All right. I'm kind of getting closer to the C. Um yeah, Mox Amber works well, you know, with especially with Sahili. Mox Amber works great with Sahili. You know, you play as a heal, you play your Mox Amber, make another artifact. Um, it works great there. Um, deck, yeah, the deck may not quite be there yet, but, you know, we got some stuff. Uh, we're going to continue on kind of talking about that kind of deck, because that's that's what these colorless cards help us out here. Uh, we have Karn, the Great Creator, for loyalty, five, or sorry, four mana, five loyalty. Activate abilities of artifacts your opponent's control can't be activated. That's not too relevant in standard, but it'll come up sometimes. You know, you'll play against somebody with a treasure map or whatever. And plus one until your next turn, up to one target non-creature artifact becomes an artifact creature with power and toughness, each equal to its CMC. So you can start turning your non-creature artifacts into creatures for a turn to be able to block. So you got your guild globe that you pay to, draw a card, um, then you tick up your car and turn your guild globe into a 2-2 to be able to help block and everything. So that's a thing. Uh, or minus two, choose an artifact card you, you own from outside the game or in exile. Reveal that card and put it into your hand. So can you have enough good sideboard artifact cards to make Karn worth it? I think that's what you really want. You want some sideboard artifact cards that you get to play. The obvious one is Sorcerer Spyglass. Meteor Golem, of course, also. So that's two. Um, if we try to think of some other ones, we have uh, uh, the, the Transmogrifying Wand, which is like four mana. You pay one and tap it. You exile a creature and turn that into like a 2-4 ox. You can start, you know, you can do that. You can have Chaos Wand against uh, control decks or like decks with a lot of instants and sorceries where you can start playing your opponents instants and sorceries if you want to go grab your chaos wand um, Azor's gateway or treasure map you can have like those kind of things if you want some card advantage um, a lot of people are saying immortal sun but immortal sun would shut down your Karn so I don't, I don't know if you really want to go grab immortal sun uh, icy manipulator yeah, if you want you want an icy manipulator against the deck, Thalmatic Compass is a pretty good one. Go grab a Thalmatic Compass. That's a cool one. Um, God Pharaoh Statue. Yeah, make your spells your opponents play cost more. Uh, I'm not so sure about that one. Somebody said Bolus Citadel. If you want if you want to go grab a Bolus's Citadel, that's something you could do. I guess you could grab a Vivian's Arcbow also. Vivian's Arcbow, also an artifact. Uh, not so sure we're playing a Karn to be able to do that, but, I mean. Parhelion 2, Weatherlight, any of those kind of things. Uh, you cannot get Ugin. Uh, no, Ugin's just colorless. You know, you, you, you can only get an artifact card. So I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think Karn's quite there yet. I don't think the artifacts are quite good enough in standard, but maybe, maybe there's some things you can do. I think the the most of, like the the biggest things to get are like Spyglass and Meteor Golem. Those seem like the the biggest uh, real things to get. Um, yeah, the artifact that bounces. What's the artifact that bounces? 
It's an infinite combo with Tez and Psy. Are you talking about like Sahili or, or Psy, I guess? Psy, Psy and Sahili, either one, Tezzeret, and Artifact that bounces. What's, what's an Artifact that bounces? So there's a five mana artifact creature that whenever it enters the battlefield, you bounce target Guardians of Kolios from Dominaria. Artifact creature, whenever Guardians of Kolios enters the battlefield, you may return another target historic permanent you control to its owner's hand. It doesn't return itself. So you'd have to have, so it doesn't really go infinite. You'd have to have two of them to go infinite. Yeah. We're going to be sub-battling till midnight, which hopefully we should get on. Yeah, we should probably get on that. We're almost at 4 o'clock. This, this review is taking a long time. Um, so, yeah, you need two of them. I, I'm, I'm not big on that. Okay. Um... So Karn, right now, like a D, but, you know, has a lot of potential if artifacts start, you know, being a bigger part of standard than what they are now. Ugin, the Ineffable, six mana, four loyalty, all your color to spells, cost two less to cast, plus one, exile the top card of your library face down and look at it, create a 2-2 two -two colorless spirit creature token. When the token leaves the battlefield, put the exile card into your hand. And minus three, destroy target permanent. That's one or more colors. So a couple of things here. Um, I could see like, so the biggest thing is that minus three, destroy a permanent. That's one or more colors. If we're talking about like a Grixis control deck, Grixis can't deal with enchantments very well. They really struggle. Can they play Ugin in the sideboard to help deal with enchantments? Maybe. Maybe Ugin could be something there where it does cost six mana. I know that's just like one less than Meteor Golem basically. But Ugin also has this plus ability that's really good. So how it works is you um, basically you make a 2-2, and underneath that 2-2, you, you uh, basically have like your top card of your library face down. So you're ticking up making 2-2s, and then whenever your 2-2s die, which that's what happens, creatures die, whenever the creature dies, whatever that card is, you, you get to go put that in your hand. Um, so that... that uh, <clears throat> So that can get you some good card advantage too, get you some bodies, and so on. So I could see a Grixis control deck playing an Ugin. Um, yeah, Grixis has other real Planeswalkers though, but they don't kill enchantments, right? So Ugin can actually kill an enchantment. That's the big reason to play Ugin is because it can kill an enchantment. Um, yeah, I know it's leaves battlefield, not dies, sorry. But yeah, it's whenever the tokens leave the battlefield. Um, are we playing it in like our Tezzeret deck maybe like color spells costing two, last, two less is that going to be like do you want to play like this could also just be an artifact matters deck also um, like where we have our guild globe have it cost zero mana draw a card kind of thing play your zero mana treasure map all that kind of stuff um, so yeah I, I like Ugin here. I'm going to give Ugin a C. I could see Ugin being played in a few different decks and also a powerful card in like a fringe deck also. Um, in like our, our Tezzeret Sahili deck, it's probably a card in that kind of deck as well. So I'm giving Ugin a C. Uh, maybe C plus if we expected to see a little bit more play in... Okay, actually, let's go C plus because... All right, I'm going C plus, yeah. Even though it's not like the best six mana planeswalker we have in standard, any deck can play it. The fact that it's colorless means it can go anywhere, and that's that's pretty important. So any deck can throw this this planeswalker in it. Um, you know, you want you want something in mono green that can destroy some permanents. You're playing mono green ramp. Actually, mono green ramp Ugin sounds pretty sweet in it, being able to destroy some permanents and everything like that. Uh, you know, like your elf, you're playing elf ball. Uh, get some Ugins in there. For like some removal it's like you know one more than your teferi uh but like for that deck it, the extra mana is probably not that bad 
and then you get to also like you know get your card advantage with your two twos destroy some stuff yeah and you can't destroy any permanent that's one or more colors that is true you know there's not there's not very many lands that are colors but um i guess in ascanta a flipped ascanta would that be blue whenever you flip an ascanta i'm not sure um so okay never mind let's go hmm maybe even b minus then all right, I'm, I, you're y'all are talking me up on this card. So post flip, no, you cannot kill it. So post flip, it it is not blue anymore. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the ra my ratings are just for standard. Yes. All right, so C plus B minus. Um, I'll go with C plus. Powerful card, still C play in some fringe decks or kind of a common card in a few different decks. All right, Ugin's Conjurant. I've actually never read this card yet. So it's X for a 0, 0, enters the battlefield with X1 counters on it. Oh, actually, never mind. I did read this card. Sorry. If damage will be dealt to Ugin's Conjurant while it has an X, while it has a 1-1 one, one counter on it, prevent that damage and remove that many 1-1 one, one counters from Ugin's Conjurant. Um, I think this is just a limited card. Uh, it does kind of work kind of well with Ugin, how it costs two less, and you can play it for a bunch, but... So if if you if you have it as like a, a four four, uh, you pay it for four four mana four four against like red and they lightning strike it, you would prevent that damage, and then you would remove that many one one counters. So then it would just turn into a one one, and then you know it's not nearly so. That's kind of even just worse than just being a four four. Um, yeah, that's just a limited card. Firemind vessel, four mana enters the battlefield tapped tap add two mana of different colors um i think this is just only like this is basically just a limited card except for except for like a niv mizzet deck could could play this card um this is an option there for a, a niv mizzet deck that really cares about having a, a whole bunch of different two mana or two color cards so i'm going with a d here because uh, i could certainly see me playing this in a niv mizzet deck uh, where you need you know where you want you know your red green cards and your blue white cards and your black white cards and all that kind of stuff um and that kind of deck you would not want to play circuitous route um you would because you're going to want to play a whole bunch of shock and shock lands and buddy lands so that's basically the, the one deck for firemind vessel um also if you're needing like more artifact ramp if you're playing like just a colorless deck where you want you want like a whole lot of colorless ramp uh May, you know, maybe you could see some play there too, where it helps fix your mana. So going with the D for final mana vessel. God Pharaoh statue, six mana, legendary artifact, spells your opponent's cast, cost two more to cast. At the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses one life. Um, that's going to be a limited card for me. Yes, they have to be two d different mana. Yes. You have to choose like one white, one blue for example, or one green, one red. You cannot add two green. They have to be different color. I think God Pharaoh Statue was made for Commander, but I'm going to give it a limited rating. For, you know, not a standard card. Guild Globe, two colorless artifact. Whenever Guild Globe enters the battlefield, draw a card, two, and sack it. Guild, sack Guild Globe, add two mana of different colors. Um, like I've said, I like this card for standard for different artifact decks. I think it's a really good filler for that. Um, so I'm going to go with like a D plus here. I think it's just a really nice filler to fit in, you know, any kind of artifact matters kind of deck. And, you know, could certainly see more play after rotation if we do have more artifacts in the format. Iron Bully, three mana for a 1-1 one, one menace whenever it enters the battlefield put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature that's limited mana geode three mana tap add one mana of any color whenever it enters the battlefield scry one M maybe you play this instead of firemind's vessel because it costs three instead of four and it has scry one in the niv mizzet deck maybe i'll just go with the d there maybe we could play a mana geode and Prismite, two, two mana for 2-1. You can pay two to add one mana of any color. Limited. 
Sahili Silverwing, four mana, two, three, flying. When it enters the battlefield, look at the top card of target opponent's library. Limited. All right, we got six lands here to talk about. Uh, Gateway Plaza is already in standard, um, so we really have five lands. <clears throat> Blast Zone. When Blast Zone enters the battlefield, or enters the battlefield with a charge counter on it, you can tap to add a colorless mana. Pay XX and tap it. Put X charge counters on Blast Zone. Pay three and tap. Sacrifice Blast Zone. Destroy each non-land permanent with converted mana cost equal to the number of charge counters on Blast Zone. This card is awesome. This is a really, really good land. The fact that it's kind of slow is okay in standard because standard is kind of slow. Um... But you get to just play lands that get to destroy the permanents that your opponents have. That is awesome. The big thing that's the biggest problem with Blast Zone and Standard is that our mana is good enough here where we're mostly wanting to play three color decks. You know, if you think about like Esper Control would love a Blast Zone, but it's also a you know, it's it's a trying to play its Kaya's Wraths and its blue cards and everything like that. It's hard to fit colorless lands in the three color mid range and control decks. That's the problem with Blast Zone. Um, so can can you fit in it in? Can you play like a more colorless deck and fit some Blast Zones in? And you just play like a real colorless heavy deck, maybe. But I could still see this being like a, a one of, um, like a one of in like Esper Control kind of thing. Um, I could see this a lot of different places. If our mana gets worse um, and we people start playing two color decks more blast zone is going to be better there if there's just enough cards for like two color decks you can play like two color control decks and you can start playing some more blast zone um yeah in a reclamation deck and if you're just playing simic reclamation and not playing red if you're just playing blue green you can maybe fit some blast zones in your deck um i'm not sure about sideboard and tron i don't know probably i don't know about that um <clears throat> but yeah i so blast zone it i kind of i think this is probably gonna be like an a minus i feel like this is just gonna be in a whole lot of different decks but not really like a four of but it just feels like it can just kind of go anywhere um so i'm gonna give it an a minus because it's not really gonna be too much of a of a four of i don't think um but i like it quite a bit um, has some good value with Crucible and other things like that. Um, there are ways to proliferate it. There's just a lot of good synergy with it, and you just get to destroy stuff for a land slot. You know, you're not you're not spending a spell on Blast Zone. You're spending a you know it's your land slot. I like it quite a bit. So I'm gonna go A minus. Emergence Zone. Tap add colorless one in a tap. Sack Emergence Zone, you may cast spells this turn as though they had flash. I mean, it's an uncommon, so I'm giving this the limited rating. I don't think... Like, there are some good lands here in Standard, and I don't think you play this. I don't think you play this over Blast Zone or over Mobilized District, that we'll get to later. I don't think that that, that effect is worth sacrificing your land. If if our lands were not as good, you know, this in a different format, this could see play, but I don't think in this Standard. Yeah, it is sp spells, right? So, you know, you get to cast your creatures and your planeswalkers and all that kind of stuff as Flash. Uh, Gateway Plaza is already in the format. Um, interplay can inter. Oh, so like Emergence Zone, I'm giving just the limited rating. Yeah. Interplaner Beacon. Uh, whenever you cast a planeswalker spell, gain one life. Tap to add a colorless and pay one and tap. Add two mana of different colors. Spend this mana only to cast planeswalker spells. This seems perfect for a Planeswalker Super Friends deck. It's perfect. You tap this and tap another one. You add two, any two mana. You want like five color Super Friends, four color, three color. This is perfect there. Gain some life also, which is what you, you need some life in those kind of decks. Perfect. So going with D for a you know a janky build around card. You know, let's build some Super Friend decks. I love building Super Friends decks. Um, I'll be sad when... I'm, my opponent casts Elder Spell and kills all my cool Planeswalkers that I played with my Interplanar Beacon. Um, yeah.
All right, we have Karn's Bastion, tap to add a colorless, and then also it just has four tap proliferate. I like this card too. We have some really, really good colorless lands in this set, uh, which is going to like, you know, make you want to play less colors, but then there's so many good color, like these colorless lands just are fighting so hard against all of the multicolor spells. It's, it's a really interesting dynamic to have uh, all these things in the same format. But this is this is just a really solid land where you, it's just a regular land. But then when you have extra mana and you don't really have other things to do, you can proliferate. You have a, do you have a bunch of creatures with one one counters? You can attack. How does your opponent block? If your opponent blocks in such a way in self in such a way where proliferating will blow them out, you can do it at instant speed. If they block in such a way where proliferating does not blow them out. Then you know you don't you know maybe they just like don't do some blocks because they're scared of you proliferating. Then you're just like okay cool. Then you just cast your other spells your second main, you know like you can just do that. Um, you know if you have your your planes if you have like your planeswalker in play that's at seven loyalty that ultimates at eight, you can spend your turn with Karn's Bastion proliferate put it up to eight then ultimate your planeswalker boom, kind of thing like that. So yeah, this is a, I feel like, yeah, somebody said a solid B. Yeah, I feel like this is a solid B. The thing is, is like, we also have Blast Zone and we have Mobilized District. And I I love Blast Zone and Mobilized District. And it's like, how are we fitting in room for Karn's Bastion also? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have the answer to that question yet. But it's a really solid card. It's a solid land. And I I feel like a B is just a, that's a, that's a perfectly fine rating for this. And like that's what I kind of want to make an art like a colorless artifact deck where you can play like four district, four Karns Bastion, four Blast Zone, and just make like maybe make it like one color, you know, just make it like a, a blue deck, uh, you know, where you have like Sahili, um, also, and then like your artifacts, and and you have you have the blue Tezzeret that's in standard right now, um, you have uh, you have Psy, you have Sahili. And there's like a good blue removal spell that we talked about. You have this, you have like this transmutation card. If you need blue, good blue removal, you have that thing um, for two mana removal in blue. And then you can just play all these utility lands. Like there's also even that, that utility land, the colorless, like, you know, you play it, you scry one. Like that card's pretty cool. So <clears throat> maybe you can go like very light color and play mostly colorless and maybe play a couple artifacts to help you even with your mana uh even i don't know maybe there's a deck there yeah a bunch of field field of ruins so you can play a few basic islands because you're gonna need some basics to go with your field of ruin all right uh mobilized district uh it adds a colorless, pay four, it becomes a 3-3 citizen creature with vigilance until end of turn. It's still a land. Oh, I missed that thing has vigilance too. I missed that part. That's even better. This ability costs one less to activate for each legendary creature and planeswalker you control. This card is awesome. Having a getting being able to have a creature with your lands is just really, really strong. Um you know, being able to block like your opponent attacks in, you have like this 3-3 that they have to like worry about when they're attacking in. Um, against a control deck, you get, you have a land that's an extra threat that where they're using their removal on your stuff. Uh, you're, you can be beating them, to, you know, after you trade a bunch one for one, you still have this three, three left, uh, you know, gets under the counter magic kind of thing. Um, you can't like tuck it with, you know, they, they Teferi tuck something and then you activate, activate your mobilized district to finish off their Teferi. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's just awesome. I, like, I feel like this is just an A. Yeah, I think Mobilized District's just an A. Uh, I think it's just a, a just a, a format staple. They can just go so many different places. Yeah, I think Mobilized District's just an A. So it's, I've only given an A to two other cards. I think, I think, I guess that there's only three A's format staples in the format that I gave. Um, Gideon Blackblade, Nicol Bolas, Dragon God, and Mobilized District. Definitely gave out quite a bit of A-minuses. But I feel like those are like three. 
It's not the best in three color decks, no. That's like the big tension. Is our mana is really good right now, and like we want three color decks, and mobilized districts not the best there. Um, but it's still really, really strong. All right, and that will finish. Uh, almost four hours there for all of the multicolor cards, colorless artifacts, and lands. All right, that was a very long uh, War of the Spark complete standard set review. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you're watching this one later on YouTube, if you didn't see any of the other colors, feel free to click on over there. Um, if y'all are watching this here in, in Twitch, there's my YouTube link, youtube.com slash totsdemonsmtg, where you can find the, the white through green all already up there. Um, all right, so uh, I guess the best, I guess we can kind of go <laughs> uh, quickly through the, the best cards that we had here. We had uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I guess the top nine cards that I gave A or A minus to. Uh, so we had three A's. We had Gideon Blackblade, Nickel Bolas Dragon God, and Mobilized District were the three A's. A minus. We had Narset, Parter of Veils, Liliana, Dreadhorde General, Ilrog, the Raised Boar, which honestly that A- minus for that one is probably a, uh, a hopeful thing, but that, that one may not actually be an A-. minus. I mean, but oh well, that card's just sweet, and it's really good. Uh, and then Dovin's Veto was an A-. minus. Uh, Teferi, whatever the time render or whatever the Teferi is, that was an A minus. And then Blast Zone, we also gave an A minus. Um, there's quite a few B pluses in there as well. But um, yeah. Looks like a lot of a lot of cool stuff in for standard here. A whole lot of I gave a whole lot of C's of like, you know, build around fringe decks, but there there seems to be so many decks to build around with War of the Spark, and I'm quite excited for it. So this upcoming Thursday, the 25th, is whenever War of the Spark will be legal on Arena. I will be playing Standard right away. We're going to be doing a 12-hour stream on, on that the 25th there, playing new Standard decks, building around cards. Definitely starting off with Grixis, start off with a five-color niv deck, starting off with Gruul, and probably a black-white mid-range deck with Oketra and Bantu and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, kind of going from there. So, uh, hope to see y'all then also, um, if you're watching this, you know, the, the set review later on, uh, hope to see you there at the Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Todd Stevens MTG. Uh, but thanks for watching and I'll see you for another video.